members and the viewing public to this ordinary meeting of the City Council. Um, I'm just going to take some advice from Paul. And I'm going to ask the Interim Director of Legal and Governance to announce the housekeeping arrangements again, because although we're the same group of people down here, we have a fresh number of people in the gallery. Please can I have your attention whilst I make a few housekeeping announcements. I'll pay attention myself. Um, please can members of the public familiarise themselves with the fire safety and evacuation notices displayed in the public gallery. <coughs> in the event of the fire alarm sounding, please take instruction from the security attendants who will be in attendance throughout the meeting. Can I request everyone to switch mobile devices to silent mode so as not to disturb the conduct of the meeting? The meeting today will be webcast and the recording will also be available for people to view later through the Council's website. It is also possible that Sheffield Live TV will record and rebroadcast this meeting. Photography, video and sound recording of the meeting is permitted, but the Lord Mayor does have discretion to withdraw or suspend this permission if the recording is disrupting the conduct of the meeting or is being undertaken in a manner which could capture personal information or if a member of the public participating objects to being recorded. Any member of the public due to speak at the meeting who does not wish to be recorded should say so at the start of their speech and the Lord Mayor will suspend the permission to record their contribution. For safety reasons, please may I request that recording equipment is not held over the balcony. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to conclude those housekeeping announcements by saying that there is one urgent item of business added at the end of our agenda to give approval for the Interim Director of Finance and Commercial Services to be designated as the Statutory Chief Finance Officer. And we do need to do that at this meeting. <coughs> Sorry. Oops. Oh. Um, and can I inform members also that I've given permission for a correspondent of the news channel Dunya News to film from within the chamber. They're particularly interested in filming during item eight of the agenda, the adoption of the APPG definition of Islamophobia. And finally, this meeting is scheduled to finish at 6.30, but I think that was stretching a point. So I'm not sure when I will adjourn the meeting so we can have a comfort break, so I do want to crack on with the meeting. Uh, technically, according to my advisor here, it's now seven o'clock. But if we all discipline and rattle through, okay. So, uh, item two, are there any other apologies for absence? I know that councillors Turpin and Elliot need to leave for another meeting, and I have spotted Mark Jones has now turned up. And you're going to have to leave as well, are you, Councillor Price? Okay. Um, we're not going... Oh, sorry. Are there any declarations of interest? I think you've already done it, haven't you, Colin? Uh, yes. Um, I was just on... on uh, for, the, for the record, uh, we've got the information about declaring interest on, on land. We've got the information already uh, on record about declaring interest on, on landlords, which pertains to a notice of motion later in the, the agenda. Thank you. Um, item four, public questions and petitions and other communications. Um, I was going to ask the leader if he had anything he wanted to add. Thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, um, obviously members are all aware of the situation it's that incident this council has called a major incident. Um, I've been up there myself with local councillors uh, in the area, um, noticing the absolute pain, to be honest with you, and the upset that residents have had to face up there, but also to thank our staff and other staff who have been working tirelessly um, to, to help the issues. It became very clear to us on Monday stroke Tuesday that there was an engineering issue, but there was also a humanitarian issue. 
on welfare issue. So, Lord Mayor, if I could, if I could just ask the Chief Exec just to update members with uh, up-to-date uh, information, just so that we are aware. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, go ahead, Kate. Thanks, Leader, and thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, uh, members. On Saturday, the 3rd of December, as Terry said, a water main burst in the Stannington area of the city. This caused around 1.3 million litres of water to enter the gas network in the area resulting in around 3,000 properties in the Stalling, Stunnington, Mayland Bridge and Hillsborough areas being left without gas. Remedial work was undertaken by Yorkshire Water shortly thereafter to repair the water main, but the water ingress has caused serious sustained disruption to residents and businesses across the area. Cadent, who own and are responsible for the gas network, have been working on site since that time to restore gas to affected properties. This has, been, this has required the pumping out of all of the water that entered the network purging pipes before repressurising the network and then making good damage to meters, boilers and gas appliances affected by the water ingress. The incident coincided with a level three cold weather alert, freezing temperatures and snowfall across the area as, as we all know, and this has made both the engineering work more difficult to complete than it would otherwise have been and has also had a very significant impact, um, as the leaders said, for residents who've been without heating for this very cold period. To respond to the incident, Sheffield City Council declared a major incident on Tuesday the 6th of December and will put in place a full incident structure, including twice daily multi-agency tactical coordinating groups, regular strategic coordinating groups and an on-site bronze commander based at Lomas Hall in Stannington. And this will continue, uh, the structure will continue until the major incident is stood down. Working with Cadent and Yorkshire Water, Sheffield City Council has been coordinating the humanitarian response to the incident. This has included providing electric heaters and blankets and non-electric items such as blankets and thermal clothing to residents, undertaking door knocking and welfare checks on known vulnerable residents and providing other support such as emergency accommodation when required. Adult social care teams have undertaken checks on all people known and referred to social care services to ensure that they're safe and well. The council's utilised its cost of living helpline to provide additional support to residents when needed, including accessing hardship schemes. Because of the increased use of electric heaters, uh, this has resulted in additional pressure on the electricity network in some parts of the area during the course of last week, which resulted in disruption to electricity supplies as well for some households, adding to the difficulties they faced. So in response, Northern Power Grid have provided free food for mobile vans in the area, and Sheffield City Council has now taken over the running of these and are continuing to run them. We're, we're serving, each van is serving well over a thousand hot meals every day in various locations. Cadent and Yorkshire Water have agreed uh, a compensation package for those affected. Details of that are available on the Cadent website and affected households should each receive leaflets through their door setting out how to claim this. The situation as of this morning is that 196 <coughs> properties remain without gas. These are primarily in the Malin Bridge area around Home Lane and are mainly, but not entirely, commercial and industrial properties. However, within the 196, there are around 87 across the affected area where Cadent have not been able to access the, bu the building. Once contact is made with the resident, Cadent will reconnect the supply to these households. This has been a challenging, unprecedented and dynamic incident. We cannot say for certain when all properties will be reconnected, although it is the case that the numbers of affected properties have reduced, has reduced dramatically in the last few days and that most now have gas reconnected. We will continue with the response until all properties have had their gas reconnected. We will also be putting in place a recovery strategy to support the community in returning to normality and a full lessons learned and debrief will be conducted once the incident is concluded. Um, I'd just like to finish by expressing my thanks to all who've worked really hard on the ground, especially the many Sheffield City Council staff who've dropped their work, redeployed to support the incident and have been an absolute credit to the Council. Most of all, I know all colleagues who've been involved would wish to thank the people of Stannington and Mayland Bridge who've shown incredible resilience and community spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Exec. I'd like to echo that, I'm sure. On behalf of all the councillors here, we'd like to thank everybody, uh, the three local councillors, the local MPs and their staff and everybody who has gone up there to help. I know it's been difficult and it remains a difficult situation. Um, I know that Anne, Councillor Murphy, just wanted to make a quick announcement. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, as uh, with the tradition at the Christmas Council, I will be coming round with Tony Dams, my uh, gorgeous assistant over there, to collect for HARP, which is the homeless and rootless uh, people in Sheffield, 
The collection will go to the Archer Project uh, once it's been collected from here. But also, just to mention that Tony has asked a special request for us to also collect the three Second World War veterans, one who's 99, uh, the other two who are 101 and 103 years of age, to just provide them with a Christmas hamper this year. So we will be bringing two envelopes round that we would like you to contribute to. And I'd like to say, where possible, it's a silent collection. So we will be coming round uh, in a few minutes. So thank you for your donations in advance of me putting your arm up your back. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Tony, you can have 30 seconds. Bloody hell. Um, Thank you. Next just item. Say that the, as Pat has uh, Anne said, the three veterans are 99, 101, and 103. So I don't anticipate making a similar request next year. Um, and we hope it will be a silent collection, though if we have to get people's arms up the bike, you might be a little bit of noise. Thank you. Right. Thank you all very much. And now we move on to petitions and public questions. Public questions can be asked and petitions can be presented at council meetings. We encourage questions or petitions to be submitted two clear days in advance of the meeting to help public attendance to be managed in a safe way at the meeting and to assist members to provide responses or answers. Petitions or questions received after the submission deadline shall be presented or asked at the meeting at, at my discretion. Um, and I have had one late question which I have suggested should go to another forum because that would be a quicker way to deal with it than here. Um, so for this meeting, one petition will be presented and questions will be taken from still eight? Yeah. Mem eight members of the public. So a period of 60 minutes is allowed in total for ordinary petitions and public questions. Can I call upon the Chief Exec to announce the petition and may I request that the petitioner be brief and keep within their time limit of three minutes. And can I also request that members keep within their maximum time limit of five minutes when responding to the petition. If you can make it three minutes, I'll be very grateful. Chief Exec. Thank you. I've received an electronic petition containing 307 signatures requesting the Council to increase the payments for residents hosting people from Ukraine. Miranda Allen wishes to address the Council and it's recommended the petition is referred to the Housing Policy Committee. Miranda, would you like to speak? Thank you. Um, so I'm here on behalf of hosts and guests and the petition is that we are petitioning Sheffield City Council with regard to the Homes for Ukraine scheme and the thank you payment. When asked by hosts if this will increase, the standard response from Sheffield Council seems to be that you're waiting for government guidance. However, numerous councils across the country have taken their own initiative and have already increased the thank you payment. And we have an appendix attached to that with examples. In the midst of the cost of living crisis, many hosts are struggling to manage the extra costs involved in housing extra people, which may result in hosting ending earlier than it needs to. We feel that the cost of increasing the thank you payment would be more cost effective in the long run than the council having to find accommodation for guests who no longer have hosts as it is no longer affordable for people. Since the scheme began back in March 22, there's been very little mention of it by the government and we are seemingly still in phase one as it was called, indicating at some point there would be further phases, i.e. the one where the government matches guests and hosts, which has never happened. So the government guidance may never come, and in the meantime, more and more Ukrainians are finding themselves homeless, often families with children and elderly or sick relatives. This is not acceptable, especially after what they've been through already. So we ask you to look at this again, taking into consideration the cost of increasing the thank you payment compared to the cost of finding homes for the ever-increasing number of homeless Ukrainians and the effect this will also have on their well-being. It is clear from other councils that this is, this is easily possible to take a clear and fair decision which supports those who are supporting Ukrainians. Lord Harrington, who set up the Homes for Ukraine scheme, was speaking on Radio 4 this week 
about how he has called for the hosting payment to be doubled for the second six months of hosting to try and keep down the number of homeless Ukrainians. There seems to be no reasonable plan in place for what happens when hosts can no longer house their guests due to the cost of living crisis or for other reasons. It's particularly hard for those hosting larger families as the payment is the same no matter how many people you are hosting, yet the more people you host, the higher the cost to accommodate them. These people were invited here for three years via a scheme founded on the generosity of volunteers and money was allocated specifically for this. The war is showing no signs of ending and the need for help is not getting any less. Currently guests are finding it extremely difficult to manage to work even though they are eager to do so. Most of them are effectively single parents as the men are not allowed to leave Ukraine unless they have exemption. The only kind of jobs they can get unless they have exceptional English with transferable skills are zero hours, minimum wage and shift work. Also trying to get and afford childcare to cover the unsociable hours and unpredictability is practically impossible so they have no chance of moving on to live independently and without hosts, the prospects are not good. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Miranda. I'm going to ask Councillor Douglas Johnson, Chair of the Housing Policy Committee, to respond. Well, first of all, thank you for bringing the petition. Um, and secondly, thank you to you and all the other people in Sheffield who have opened up the homes to accommodate people who were fleeing war and persecution. Um, and it's that humanitarian aspect of um, activity right across the city of people you know, volunteering their own homes, their own space, their own warmth to um, support people in need. Um, so you're asking specifically about the, the payments that are made. And I just wanted to let you know that, um, and I know, know it's always going to sound frustrating when, when the council's saying that, you know, um, we're looking at it and we're working on it. But in fact, I can tell you, I mean, our office have been working really hard um, lobbying the government consistently about this because, of course, this is it's a national scheme. It, you know, although some councils have done um, with, with some extra work with some more money, um, it is a national scheme, it's being promoted nationally, and there's also the issue about consistency with um, um, refugees from other areas of the world um, and ensuring that there's some sort of fairness and equity in that. Of course, we have a lot of um, uh, refugees in the city now, partly because we are a welcoming place. But in the light of that, and it is also with the, the knowledge and the understanding that officers here have developed with the Ukrainian uh, community in the city, They've been able to um, lobby government. And I think you mentioned Lord Harrington was on the radio and I can tell you that Lord Harrington was actually in the city um, and our officers were, uh, were lobbying him directly. So this is all work that goes on behind the scenes that, of course, the public don't see. The, the, the guests and the, the hosts don't see that work, but it's been going on. And so the good news is I can tell you today that um, it's paid off and we um, will be... Um, increasing the payments to £500 a month. Um, there's been an announcement from government today that all that work has paid off. Um, there is an, a government announcement that will be put into place. There's a, a package of measures there, and I'm sure our staff will be looking through that to work out you know, the exact implications and how we can use that in the best possible way to support both guests and hosts in the city. And I think that's to go on for uh, for a two-year period. And it's what, again, I said, obviously lobbying for, we've been pushing for some degree of certainty because it is always difficult having these short-term uh, uh, methods of support. So I'm um, hoping that you will get something that, that is what you want um, in the near future. I can't make an exact promise about when we'll know the detail, but I can assure you that it is now coming. So I hope that's okay. Thank you, Douglas. That sounded like almost good news. Almost. We'll wait. So, all right. We now move on to questions from members of the public. May I ask that questioners be as brief as possible when asking their questions and that members keep their responses short and succinct. This is to ensure that as much time as possible is available for other items of business on the agenda for today's meeting. Thank you in advance for your cooperation. 
So the first three questions I have are from Robin Hughes. Robin's not here. Okay, what we will do is our standard policy of making sure that a written answer to Robin's question is sent to him and we will also make sure that those are published so that everybody else can see them too. Right, so thank you, Julie. Um, the next question from Paul Wade. I understand that he is ill and unable to come, so he's withdrawn his question and intends to submit it at the next meeting. So my next question is from Jeff Cox. If Jeff can come to the microphone, please. Thank you. Um, so Jeff Cox of the South Yorkshire Climate Alliance. Um, the city declared a climate emergency four years ago. The Arab report was published um, well over 18 months ago. And pretty much to the month, the, the 10 point action plan, although not um, published, was, was kind of agreed and, and, and set out. So we've been waiting for a year for the decarbonisation route maps, which were the mechanisms chosen in the 10 point plan to deliver carbon zero for 2030. Um, at the Transport Regeneration and Climate Policy Committee in November, we heard that those seven route maps are progressing very slowly. A number of them won't be ready until the summer. A number of them won't be ready until the autumn. So my question is very simple. Will the leadership of Sheffield City Council accelerate the production of the decarbonisation route maps? Thank you, Mr. Cox. <laughs> and may I invite Councillor Julie Grocutt, co-chair of the Transport, Regen and Climate Policy Committee, to respond. Julie. Thank you, Hello, Mayor. Good afternoon, Mr. Cox. Nice to see you again. Um, with regard to the particular point that you make in relation to the um, route maps, um, we are really keen to make sure that we have engagement and co-creation of the route maps with partners across the city. It's crucial that we do this to ensure that they're successful development and implementation. Whilst we could bring forward the timetable to produce the route maps by reducing the amount of time we engage with people in the city, this risks these plans not having the buy-in and support of all city stakeholders. To begin with, the wider conversation we have, um, we have held in the city, a climate summit last month, which was well attended by partners from the public, private and voluntary sectors. It was great to hear of all the good work that is happening across the city, and this now needs to be coordinated and will be used um, effectively to help with the route maps across the city. <laughs> Although the route maps aim is to support delivery, the timescales of them being produced is not preventing action from being taken. On the 24th of November, the Transport, Region and Climate Policy Committee also approved the scope for a £3.5 million local renewable energy fund and work is now underway to identify buildings and commission audits and feasibility work. Approval was given to match fund two funding applications to support the techno-economic feasibility studies of extending the two district um, energy networks in the city as well as assessing opportunities to integrate waste heat sources to help further decarbonisation of heat in the city. This built on the heat networking zoning pilot that has been um, engaged with through, um, throughout this year. We've successfully completed £1.1 million of public sector decarbonisation scheme funded projects at the Town Hall, Aikens Hill Store and more markets with further heat decarbonisation plans commissioned for other sites to enable the bidding for future rounds of the public sector decarbonisation scheme funding. We will be delivering housing energy improvement schemes throughout homes upgrade grants, local authority delivery too, and the energy company obligations have also recently been submitted bids for further funding from the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund, which we are awaiting to hear the outcomes of. We're working to improve the sustainability and mitigate the climate impacts of decisions, projects and procurement 
throughout the development and implementation of the climate impact assessment tool. This year we have also reported for the first time to the Carbon Disclosure Project who run the global disclosure systems for companies, cities and regions to manage their environmental impact. We have recently received our score of A-, minus, only um, one of the highest score of A, obviously, um, meaning that we are very much at the top end of reporting cities, demonstrating best practice standards across adapt adaptation and mitigation and have set ambitious goals and made some progress towards achieving those goals. The main area for improvement identified through the CDP reporting is the need to have a detailed climate risk assessment and vulnerability assessment for the city and we will be addressing this next year as we participate in the Yorkshire and Humber Climate, Commi climate Commission's Climate Resilience and Adaptation Programme. So I hope that gives you some satisfaction in terms of the work that we are um, doing, the results that we've had so far, and the importance that we do place on getting the roadmaps through. But thank you very much for your question. Thank you, Councillor Grocutt. <coughs> um, please, can Abdul Rahim come to the microphone, please? Okay, thank now, you very I, much. I understand that you had two questions and that your first question has now been answered. Yeah, thank you for it. So yes. it's only your second question yes, you're going second, to ask. Yeah. The thank first you. one has been uh, uh, being um, mentioned, uh, being yeah. sorted by the email. Thank so, you. So I'm happy with that one. Okay. Yeah. The the, the, the question now is is the clean air zone, uh, which is uh, I'm I'm self-employed taxi driver, and uh, I've been in contact with the dealerships. The Hackneys are nearly after a payment plan over five years is nearly £100,000 due to pay off the vehicle. Now, due to economic crisis, I've got a mortgage with Tesco's and Sainsbury's, I've got a mortgage with the Bank of England, the interest rate's going up, and I've also got a mortgage with energy companies. And I've got an email today from British Gas that the next year, £5,000 will be a minimum charges per household on the energy I'm using. So basically, I've got so many mortgages to pay off, and like Manchester has delayed, I can't understand why Sheffield is going ahead with this clean air zone. We're struggling economic situation at the moment. We should have a wise decision and look at the impact it's going to have on people like myself. I've got five people in the house I'm feeding, and I could lose my house. I could lose a new vehicle that, that you were going to fund for £10,000, and this £10,000 isn't going to come into our individual pockets is going to go direct to the manufacturers. The manufacturers have increased the price, and they've done that with the, with the uh, government fundings. And instead of going from 60,000, they've added another 10,000 on it. So, so basically, we are, uh, your funds going to be gone, uh, be swallowed up by the manufacturing companies and dealerships. But what I would advise, like in London, there are co companies in London uh, hacking carriages which are renting vehicles out. And if, if you can utilize your funds and rent these electric vehicles out, it would be more beneficial to us drivers. And also, uh, I've driven this electric vehicle. It's, it's got a, a 350 kilowatt uh, electric battery, and I sometimes feel dizzy in it. It might be causing electromagnetic wave uh, radiation, uh, where the manufacturers have not fully understood this on the scientific side of the thing. And also, it's going to take another four years before the manufacturers are able to. I've seen the uh, videos on YouTube that it's going to take another four years before they get a full electric uh, cab on the roads. Thank you. Um, Joe, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. One more question. Is this clean air zone going to carry on forever or is there going to be a limit to it? Because if if, uh, on the BBC radio, uh, they, they've said that uh, the, the activists in the clean air zone said that the, the, the pollution levels have gone down in Sheffield and why is it still going ahead? Councillor Otten. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you for your question, Mr Raheem. Um, licensing service is currently carrying out engagement sessions with trade on revisions to the Hackney Carriage Vehicle Policy and the licensing services would, would like to meet you to discuss your proposals on vehicles, and they, they, they have your contact details, they will be in touch with you in order to set that up. Um, I will add that, you know, as part of that consultation and that policy, we, we are fully conscious of the cost of new hackney carriages, not just the electric ones, but all, all new hackney carriage vehicles um, compliant with the current policy are, are expensive at the moment, and we are considering options about other types of vehicles, but we, we are very keen to maintain the wheelchair accessible standard that having 
100% wheelchair accessible hand carriages in the city is something that we're proud of and we want to maintain, and it's a vital service to people who need that service. Um, on the clean air zone, it's possibly a question for, for other councillors, it's not a waste of streets in matter, but um, my understanding, if you want it, is that the clean air zone has to operate for as long as the clean, the, the, the air quality will, will miss the thresholds that it has to, has to set. If the air quality was to improve, um, and it would stay improved without the zone, then it would be possible to end the zone. But that would be, that's, a, that's a question to, to come to if and when that happens. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Otten. Um, I now have Jenny Carpenter, who has four questions on behalf of Better Buses for South Yorkshire. Thank you, Lord Mayor, Councillors. The draft local plan, which is before you today in this meeting, must give a strong steer towards achieving the Council's target of net zero carbon emissions by 2030. The need for synergy between land use planning and public transport is evident if a 66% reduction in car use by 2030 is to be achieved, with 80% of journeys made by public transport, cycling or walking. And so my four questions. First, does the council agree that the continued deterioration of bus services will only be reversed by bringing buses into public control? Second question, will the council therefore urge the South Yorkshire Mayoral Combined Authority to complete its franchising assessment as quickly as possible? Third question, in the meantime, Will the Council encourage the South Yorkshire Mayoral Authority to consider buying a bus operator so that it can create an operator of last resort to keep essential services running? And the fourth question, will the Council explore the legality of ring-fencing traffic offence fines and dedicating them to improving public transport and then let the public know the outcome? Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, can I ask uh, Councillor Julie Groker to respond? Thank you for the questions. Good afternoon. Lovely to see you again. Um, in response to the first question, uh, yes, I do agree that buses should be brought back into uh, public ownership. That is my view. It may not be the view of my committee. You may want to ask the rest of them how they feel about that. But I agree entirely that the deterioration of bus services is having a devastating impact on residences and on residents and businesses. An attractive, reliable and affordable public transport system is key for our long term of promoting sustainable transport, social inclusion and building for the future. The specific operating model for public transport is something that we are discussing with the Mayoral Combined Authority, both directly and through the Mayor himself, um, and we're hoping that we can continue and get to a successful position with that dialogue. In relation to franchising, a number of transport authorities are looking um, into this, to which I am assured that the staff at the MCA are considering what this looks like for Sheffield and across South Yorkshire. This piece of work has to be a priority, and we will be in touch with the relevant officers at the MCA to make sure that they do expedite this matter. Buying a bus operating company for public ownership is a complicated legal matter, but again, as we look at the current network, we have to look at all options. This is something that we feel is worthy of exploring, and I will be asking the MCA officers for an update on this point. Any surplus income generated through certain infringements, parking uh, charges and fines on the highway are already ring-fenced by law for specific purposes. This includes the provision of operation of or facilities for public transport, passenger services, environmental improvement schemes or highway improvement projects. Parking income is reported in public records. We are also looking into the possibility of applying for moving traffic offence enforcement related to the Traffic Management Act, Part 6. This income generated from this will also be bound by the same legal framework as the parking income, um, with public transport being an eligible spend for that. Thank you very much for the question. 
Right, thank you, Councillor Groker. Um, <clears throat> I have two questions next. I have one from Matthew Kalea, and I have one from John Wright, and they're both on the same issue. So can I ask you to give one question after another, and then I'll ask the leader to reply to you both at the same time. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm John Wright, and my question is, the council elections on the 4th of May 2023 will be the first to require voters to show ID at the polling station. What plans are in place to ensure that this does not exclude anyone entitled to vote, but who might not have ID? Are the council confident that there will be suitable ID available for everyone who needs it? I'm particularly worried that younger voters and the elderly might be disincentivized from voting by the introduction of these new requirements. Good afternoon. Council, uh, this Tory government uh, continues to be cruel and wasteful. Cruel as it forces through vital uh, cuts to, on vital public services on which people defend, uh, depend, and wasteful as it continues to splurge public money on unnecessary ideological projects. One such project is its introduction of voter ID as part of its Elections Act. This means that people for the first time will need a valid photographic ID when they vote. And the government is spending 180 million pounds of our money, and that in spite of no widespread evidence of voter fraud. It's nothing short of voter suppression. Um, in addition, it is being rushed through, uh, and I, I, like many people, am concerned that uh, many voters will be disenfranchised simply because they aren't aware of the changes and don't have a valid ID. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly worried about younger voters, um, specifically because there are far fewer valid forms of ID available um, to them. As has so often happened in the past few years, um, this council will be left to pick up the pieces of our Tory government's incompetence. In this case, for those people that don't have valid ID, it will become the duty of local councils to issue electoral ID documents so that these people can vote. Um, so, so my question to you, um, and it's asked in good faith, in light of this, has the council started preparations for photo ID and are officers confident that they have sufficient resources to implement this scheme, particularly given the lack of time that they've had uh, been given by the government to prepare and given the lack of clarity on the rules? Thank you. Thank you, Matthew and John, and I will ask the leader to respond. Thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Killian and, and Mr Wright, for the, for the questions. I, too, am really concerned about the situation, to which so that I'm getting regular briefings by officers and the electoral office on this. I've got a two-and-a-half-page answer, but I don't prepare to, 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 to read that all out. I'll just give you the bullet points, and then I'll get this email out to you. So. The Elections Act 2022 introduces a requirement for voters to show ID before issued uh, the ballot paper at the polling station. The task has been made more challenging than it would otherwise have been because of the electoral services and the electoral office across the country still awaiting the regulations. Sheffield City Council will run a communications campaign alongside the national media campaign. We will also be doing um, an elector does not possess one of the documents on the list, they can apply in person or online for a voter authority certificate. This will be issued by the central print supplier. Assuming, assuming that Parliament make the necessary regulations, the system to apply for a voter authority certificate, VAC, goes live on the 16th of January 2023. Not long at all. We will carry out training for our staff and on the new processes involved in the electorate uh, applying for the voter authority certificate. Polling staff training will be ongoing. The government have made available some 
additional funding to help cover the costs of the new voter ID. Nowhere near enough, let me tell you. As with the elections, one of our core objectives of May 2023, I'll say this again, as with all elections, one of our core objectives for May 2023 will be to ensure that everyone who is registered to vote is able to cast the vote. And that is the principle that we will be going forward on. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Thank you, Leader. Um, please, can Nessa Rafiq come to the microphone? Right. They are not here, so I will ask for a written reply to be sent to them and to be included or published as with the minutes. Um, which therefore concludes this item of business. So I'm going to move on to members' questions. There are no urgent items of business. So 5.2, questions on the joint authorities. This item of business is to provide an opportunity for members of the council to ask questions on the discharge of the functions of the South Yorkshire Joint Authorities for Fire and Rescue and Pensions and of the South Yorkshire Mayoral Combined Authority. Uh, Councillor Jane Dunn has given advance notice of three questions relating to the South Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Authority. Copies of the questions have been circulated at this meeting and this has enabled Councillor Tony Dams, the Council's spokesperson on the Fire and Rescue Authority, to arrange for a response to be given at this meeting. So, Jane, would you like to ask your question? There's only one question, Lord Mayor. Well, I can only see one on here anyway. Sorry. Okay. Can Fire and Rescue Jane, Jane. Jane. Have you got three questions, or you did have only one? I wasn't here. I do apologise, everybody. I was at the hospital with my mum, so I apologise if I've missed the question. Okay. It, but I've only got the one on here. Okay. okay. It looks like they've put them all together. That's what I mean. There was only one on the written, oh, okay. so I do apologise. Yeah. Okay. Can the Fire and Rescue Authority please update the council a prohibition notice served on Wicker Riverside Building? When were inspections carried out and what are the responsibilities on the landlord? Thank you. Thank you, Jane. I know those are questions that have been worrying a lot of people here. Tony. Well, Mayor, I was anticipating several in-depth questions on this particular issue. So I've arranged for Andy from the fire service, who is much more clued up than I am. So I am a bit clued up, but he's much more clued up than I am. Thank you, Welcome Lord Mayor. Andy. Uh, yeah, thank you, and thanks ever so much for allowing me the opportunity to update members uh, on the Riverside Flats at, at, at Wicker. Um, the update so far is that we, the Fire and Rescue Service, has been the enforcing authority, issued a prohibition notice uh, on the building um, last week on Monday, I believe it was. It's currently got an enforcement notice that runs out on the 31st of January 2023. This is a building that uh, we've been doing lots of work with over the last two years. I'm sure you're all familiar of, uh, that it hit the uh, regional and national news a couple of years ago in relation to um, potential compartmentation issues and also external cladding. Um, we've been working closely with the uh, landlords, which are Nine Developments Limited, uh, the Right to Management Company, um, which was put in place by the residents uh, around about 2019, I believe, and also Love Your Block, who managed the building on behalf of the residents. Um, as it stands at the moment, I was going to bring some technical officers with me today to provide some uh, in-depth technical advice if you had questions around that, but unfortunately not able to come because they're actually having a meeting this afternoon uh, with the responsible persons. So we're encouraged by the work um, that we're doing with the responsible persons at the moment. We have received a joint statement from them, which we have replied to uh, in relation to the five points that they raised, mainly around funding um, to secure the remedial work that will be required in the building. I suppose the, our number one priority 
is and always will be the residents of the building. Uh, and my thanks must go to Janet Sharp in Sheffield City Council, who I've been working really closely with, should we need to uh, decamp the building uh, after the 31st of January. But as we stand at the moment, the enforcement notice, the prohibition notice, still stands uh, at this moment in time. Like I said, uh, my office is still continue to visit the building. Uh, we've, we've put on letters to every single resident in the building and tonight we also have a virtual call for all the residents to join. That's at six o'clock this evening. Uh, I'll be on the call to answer any questions of the residents. Uh, I know Janet will be on the call also and uh, my technical officers. We have one planned for tonight and we have one planned for tomorrow night for residents also. Uh, if the residents want to meet us face to face, then we'll facilitate a meeting face to face after these virtual calls. But our message is quite clear to the responsible persons that there are, it, it's been a nightmare for the tenants and we wholly uh, appreciate that and our responsibilities are for the tenants of the building and the safety of those tenants within inside the building and we're hoping to bring this to a really quick conclusion. Um, but we're encouraged by the dialogue that we've had so far with the responsible persons and that continues to be the case. What we need to see is a clear, clear timeline uh, of events uh, secure funding for the remedial work and if we get that then we can revisit the prohibition notice uh, in due course but at this moment in time this has been going on for almost two years and I think the residents and probably yourselves and us as a service need to bring this uh, nightmare to a conclusion. Happy to answer any questions Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. Are, are there any, I'm thinking particularly of the local councillors, did you want to ask Martin? <coughs> It's not so much a question, I just wanted to say thank you to the Fire and Rescue Service and to the council workers who've been working on this. Um, we've been kept in the loop as local councillors and we really appreciate that. It's a really awful situation for the residents there. It was really awful when they had to leave their homes before Christmas a couple of years ago because of it and we really do need to bring this to an end because it's, it's not fair on people having to live somewhere where they don't feel safe, where there's issues with compartmentation, flammable cladding. And we really do need to bring this to a close. Um, thank you for all of your efforts. Really appreciate it. That's absolutely fine. And uh, you have my assurance that uh, through the normal means, through the fire authority, or should you require any more information, then I'm quite happy to, to provide you the information. And should the situation change and we do get secure funding, we do get the remedial works, and we do get the, uh, the exposure works that we ask for on the ninth floor, uh, then I'll happy to pass that on uh, to yourselves and keep you updated. But I do know it's a real worry for yourselves and also the residents. Thank you very much, Andy. So, Jane, did you want to ask a supplementary? Yeah, please, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I worked with you really closely when this first came to light as I was the cabinet lead. I would like to know, have government liaised with you directly as a fire service? Have they asked for evidence? Um, do you know, kind of, things like that? Because I'm really, really frustrated, as Councillor Phipps said, that they are just sitting back and passing the book constantly on this, and it's been left at the door of, you know, of, our, you know, of residents. So it was really... I'm not asking you to be political, don't worry, but I'm interested to know how much you've worked with government and how closely they are monitoring just to make sure that you have the resources and able to do this. Because while you're doing that, you're not able to tend other, you know, other things and we know that you've had funding cuts. So, th but thank you anyway. Yeah, so the answer to that question is yes, I've been in direct contact with Duloc. They ring me probably... Last week they rang me about two or three times for an update on the situation. I've sent all correspondence through that we've given to the residents and also our correspondence that we've provided to the responsible persons. They continue to ring me and speak to me uh, and on the large they've been very supportive of the action that we've taken. Um, I've I briefed the Duluk representative who was briefing the uh, ministers last week on Friday to the current situation. They generally ring me at the end of a week uh, for an update. Um, so yeah, they are they are fully briefed, and on the whole, um, they, they've been quite supportive after report. Yeah. One final. Uh, it is quite a long time since this started. So has this interest uh, built recently? As we've seen quite a lot of pressure 
regarding Grenfell has this escalated in the last six to 12 months more than because it isn't this didn't happen six months ago it happened years ago yeah you're quite right so it was it, we're coming up for the sort of two-year anniversary now where I personally attended with our inspecting officers and where we issued the enforcing uh, the enforcement notice the idea behind an enforcement notice is to put pressure on the responsible persons to do the remedial work clearly that's not been the case and two years down the line then as the enforcing authority on behalf of the safety of the residents and to try and bring this to a conclusion uh, unfortunately we've had to serve a prohibition notice uh, when the, the current enforcement notice runs out and the reason why we it's not very normal to to, to provide a forward-facing prohibition notice normal protocol would be you go to a building you find an issue with it and you serve a prohibition notice which takes immediate effect however on this occasion the uh, the issues around the enforcement notice which are nearly two years old uh, still remain to be the case and we thought it only appropriate to give the residents of the building enough notice to, and you know to try and sort some accommodation out rather than go in after christmas and serve an enforcement notice with very little time um we thought that with with sheffield city council the right thing to do we're still really hopeful really hopeful that we can bring this to a satisfactory conclusion but we need to see some real firm commitment around funding and to sort the remedial works out because the people of that building deserve it and they're paying increased service charges and it's not fair thank you andy that was very comprehensive and very useful for all of us thank you for taking the time out no of your day to come here no worries. Oh. <laughs> Tony can Gamble i just would like to say something it's all right i'm not going to sing um can i thank andy for coming along and giving us that report because it's an extremely serious issue and it's been going on too long and um, I think the landlords need to understand we're not prepared to put up with it any longer. It needs bringing to a resolution. And I'm pleased that the local councillors and the MPs are uh, very much involved in what's happening. So thanks again, Andy. You can go and put some fires out now. He's not Billy Joel. Oh, sorry, obscure reference from old lady there, sorry. Um, are there any other questions relating to the pensions or fire and rescue or mayoral combined authority? <coughs> In which case we'll move to our favourite item, supplementary questions. Written answers from the leader of the council and policy committee chairs to questions submitted by members in advance of the meeting have been emailed to all members and circulated at this meeting. And this item of business is to provide an opportunity for members who had submitted questions to ask one brief, pertinent, oh, it's not written down here, supplementary question for each question asked. So we'll do the usual, I call a page, you put your hand up. Oh, Shafak, do, you, do I need to ask? Can page, I just fill on Page there? one. Uh, not much of an answer, but... Given the time, I'm going to skip not just page one, but two and three. Oh, hurrah! Because there are some of the important businesses to get through. Hurrah! Page four. Oh, Douglas, you're breaking the spirit of Christmas here. Go on then, thank you. Um, question three, um, Terry, yeah, thanks for your answer. Um, you said that you would unequivocally welcome a low-cost proposal to both improve air quality and support our buses and taxis. How about workplace parking levy, Terry? <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, obviously, we'd look into any kind of proposal put forward. I'd like to see how that's low-cost, but look forward to, to the proposal. Thank you. Right, page five. Hey, oh, sorry, Joe, your hand was wavering there, I thought. Okay, page six. Oh, Joe Otten. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Councillor Fox, um, sorry, I apologise for putting this question to you. I think it was an oversight in the governance arrangements. I can't put this to the chair of the Finance Subcommittee. Um, but my question was how was the decision made to make an application? It's 
not about the decision of the committee to accept the grant once the application was made. Um, I said, how was it made? And you just said, well, the decision was proposed. It's, it's in a passive mood. It doesn't say who, who made that decision and why. Can you uh, enlighten me at all? Well, Mayor, if, if, if I can, obviously, I'm, I'm sure we'll take, take that up through the chair of the finance subcommittee, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Question two. So, um, in applying for a third of a million pounds to support the, the, the conversion of eight flats, um, effectively a, a grant to a single private developer, do you think this, in hindsight, was good value for money in terms of what might have been applied for out of that fund, which is, you know, about improving our high streets, improving the vibrancy of our high streets, things like public realm, uh, business support. Do you, think the, 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 do you not think, in hindsight, a better use for that opportunity to apply for money could have been made? No, I think you've just asked the same question in some different words. I think we'll accept the leader's answer on that one. Um, no, Lord Mayor, the first question was about how the, uh, how the decision I'm, was made to apply for the grant, yeah. and the second was whether it was yeah. a good decision. I, I, I recognise that, and I also recognise the same answer would come again. Page seven, Barbara. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Pardon me, sir. I'll, I will be brief. Basically, there isn't an answer to my question about heat recovery in the pack. And given Councillor Grocott's answer to a public question, would you clarify which committee is meant to provide me with an answer? And really, a time scale, because there's obviously a lot of slippage. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. That was my, my understanding. I was informed that this would go to under the Waste and Street Scene Committee. But, I mean, if this is regarding climate change, then it would obviously go to TRC. I was informed that it would be going uh, within that, the Waste and Streets in Committee. Yeah, can, can I actually... Right, can I ask, have some clarification, please? Because two committees dealing with different aspects of it. Thank you. Right, so Joe's got his hand up to be helpful, I hope. Yes, to be helpful. I'm happy to, 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 to answer these questions and take this on. I'm, I'm aware of, um, that Councillor Fox gave a very lengthy answer to the question that was asked in June, which I have in front of me. Um, I think it, it would be logical for Waste and Street Sea to take this on. I'm quite happy for us to take it on. I think all committees have to have a view on climate change. It's not just everything that relates to climate change has to go to TRC. And we are responsible for an existing heat network in the city, so there is a, a logic and a synergy for us to look at further policy on, on additional heat networks. Hurrah. More work for Joe, everybody. Page eight. Page nine. Al sorry, Alexi, was it eight or... Oh, sorry, was it back eight. on seven? It's eight. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, Thanks for your answer on, um, on Barclays. Um, and my observation would be that that just seems like greenwashing and not a credible transition. But does the leader have a view on Barclays' uh, substantial investments in uh, companies which invest in the arms industry and the occupation of Palestine, for example, 1.3 billion uh, in companies which supply Israel with weapons, Elbit Systems, Raytheon, Caterpillar? Um, and do you think that should have been taken into account when awarding Barclays this contract? Thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. We are being facetious, Alexi. Yes, and, and yes, I do. Uh, but obviously, this will be not part of the finance sub. But I get, agree with you, and yes, I have. I have an opinion as well. Probably like the same as yours. Okay, page nine. Page ten. Page 11, page 12, was there a number? No. Page hmm? 13, 14, oh hang on, I'm getting way behind, I'm turning my pages over here. 14, 15, 16. Right, 14, sorry. And it should also say that the question is from uh, Nigat rather than from uh, Nabila. And did you, you have a supplementary as well? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I've got constituents uh, living in my ward uh, where repairs are called out, and um, they paint. Uh, they actually paint over the mould or plaster over it, which means 
they have to call out the repairs again. And this is just to give you an example, a family with a, a child with autism, limited English, and who relies on others for support. So I've seen um, a lot of stress and trauma caused, and I feel the response isn't good enough uh, currently. And my question is, uh, what is going to be done differently right now in uh, getting mold and damp problems rectified properly and what should I advise them who are living with these uh, issues? Thank you. Douglas. Uh, thanks. A fairly general question, and um, there's going to be a, a debate as so the next item, isn't there, about um, disrepair? Um, so, a bit of an ongoing issue. Um, I actually do think there is quite a role as uh, local councillors as well, to, because one of the big issues that we're finding through all the systems is the flow of information and getting the right information to the people who need to deal with it. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely a role for, for local councillors to be able to get that and then making sure that the actual job that needs doing is reported to the people who can do it. Douglas, can I just ask? No. Yes, I can, I'm the Lord Mayor. I thought we'd set up a task force to look into this. Yeah. Is that the next page coming yeah. out? Okay. Okay. Uh, page 17. No, I've got six, you've missed 16, haven't you? I have, but it's because I saw your name down twice, sorry. Yeah. 16. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas, for your answer. Uh, uh, A1, uh, and it says you're currently reviewing the district heating system. This is this kind of answer I've been getting every time I've been getting in touch with housing repairs. Um, how far down the reviewing system are we? As this has been happening year in, year out, and I've been getting bashed over the head with a piece of 4B2 from residents about the heating system always breaking down. Uh, and, and, and being left without heating and hot water. Thank you. Um, yes, well, thanks. I think we all appreciate that dealing with heating and hot water breakdowns, especially in this weather, is always a priority. It's always meant to be. Um, but you, you've got to ask the question. You know, you've put in your question, the district heating system has not been upgraded for the last 45 years. I mean, who's been running this council? Crashing on, crashing on, folks. Number 17, page 18, Mike. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, question two, has a unit rate increased in the heating charges from the last 12 months? It hasn't been answered, that question, Douglas. So perhaps I could help you with this. Sorry, Mike, you're next stand up. Oh, of course I'll stand up, yeah. In March this year, it was £3.4p a unit a kilowatt hour. It went up to 5 69 in April, and it went up to £12 in November. So the pensioners in Ernest Copley House, in my constituency, have seen their heating charges go up from £17 a month in November to £70, £70 pounds this year. And that, that rate of increase, that's quadrupled, the government's pay, payout for energy costs is dwarfed by the increase in payments on the heating system. Can you investigate this, please, and find out why such a rise has been allowed to happen in the fact that it's four times what it was in March this year? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, this was um, the subject of a report at the Housing Policy Committee um, in September. And... Um, that, so there's a full report there, you can read it, that's where the figures came from. Um, and the th thing about the, the district heating, or community heating fund, is it's a ring fence self-balancing count within the housing revenue account, which is itself a, a ring fence and self-balancing account. Um, so it basically costs what it costs. The cost of fuel has gone up as everyone else has gone up. So the, uh, the dilemma there was whether it's those tenants consuming um, that heating in those blocks 
to have to pay the increase, or whether it's all the other tenants in the city, given that it's all funded out of the housing revenue account. So someone's got to pay for the cost of the energy that's being used, and that, that's based how it's worked out. Page 19, Emma. Um, similar to Councillor Hamid, I only have a couple of questions, so Merry Christmas to you, Douglas. Um, so for question number three, um, you said that the current number of outstanding repairs and detailed the responsive and planned repairs, um, but that doesn't constitute how many of these are currently overdue. Um, for reference, at the last full council, um, the current the total number of outstanding repairs was 14,038, of which overdue was 6,193. So how many of the current around 16,000 that you've mentioned there that are outstanding are currently overdue? And if you don't have that direct figure to hand, higher or lower, Douglas? might not be higher or lower, it might be exactly zero. Why don't we ask um, Janet Sharp of the Housing Committee tomorrow, as we'll both be there. Page 20. Page 21. Page 22. Hello, Max. Oh, right, I'm getting reckless then. Yes? Um, so, question number 16. Um, I'm slightly confused with how this information is laid out, so do bear with me. Um, but if we're reading these dates as the average date that people on that band would have started bidding to get a council house today, that would mean that band A, top priority, would have waited four and a half months, band B would have waited six and a half months, and band C, four months, which suggests that lower priority bands are waiting less time to get a, get a you know, to the waiting you know months less time than, than those who are on priority brand A for homelessness and statutory overcrowding. Can you explain that to me please? Yeah I'm not entirely sure I was asking the same sort of question so that is something we'll need to get back to you on. Page 23, page 24, page 25, Jackie don't wave or I'll call you to speak. 25. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, question one. So, uh, thank you for the answer. It's very detailed, as we can see. Um, I understand that the council contracts out uh, several services, such as public transport. So, with that contracting out, um, does the council carry out equality assessments? Um, so is it not important that the council monitors where, how disabled friendly our public transport is in the city? We don't, we don't operate the public transport, so obviously that information is, is kept by the MCA who will have that information and if we want it they will share it with us so we would have that information if we needed to see it at any point in time. Page 25, page 26, page 27, page 28, page 29, page 30, 31, 32, 33, Ruth. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you for the answers. Obviously, this is a work in progress, uh, the food waste trial. Um, I've got uh, a few supplementary questions um, just around the benefits of the trial that might be forthcoming at this stage. Um, what are the real environmental benefits of domestic food waste collection in Sheffield, given that the objective set out by DEFRA back in 2020 was to eliminate carbon emitting landfill dumping of food waste? And yet in Sheffield, we only send um, less than 0.1% of our waste to landfill. Um, and if the food waste is being transported out of Sheffield for processing, what is actually the net environmental benefit of that? Um, and would uh, Councillor Rotten say that domestic food waste collection in a city that effectively doesn't use landfill um, is able to deliver a real contribution 
um, to our local carbon reduction targets? Uh, those questions are completely without prejudice. Just interested to know. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Muslim, for this supplementary. So my understanding is that um, if we were to run food waste across the whole of Sheffield, the savings relative to landfill, which is the first part of your question, would be 11 million tonnes of carbon dioxide a year. And, but the savings relative to incineration is 1 million tonnes of carbon dioxide a year. So there's still a saving based on the, based on the, the trial that we operated. That's my understanding of the figures. Um, I, can't, I can't give you a reference for that. It was reported to me verbally in a meeting. Um, I'm sure we could go away and work out more accurate figures. But you're perfectly right to say that the saving in carbon purely is much less if you're already incinerating relative landfill. Everybody with a waste solution compares their solution to landfill because, you know, landfill is, 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 is the worst. It is also worth saying that the, the anaerobic digestion process produces a digestate which is used by farmers, and this is the reason, actually, that ADs generally exist in rural areas and that cities pr producing food waste would generally ship them out to rural areas because it needs to be on site, much better for it to be on site for farmers when they need it at short notice. So that's why, that, and that's another valuable output of the AD process. Thank you. Now I know why you knew that answer to my question about the archers, Joe. Um, page, oh, page 34, Angela. Thank you very much for the answers, Joe, on the, um, on the smoke pollution uh, and control on smoke pollution. Um, I wonder whether, um, because obviously, you know, taking into consideration the, the rising cost of um, gas um, and lots of people having fireplaces and stoves, etc. Uh, my concern is very much about how much people are aware that um, indoors pollution due to open fire and stoves is a real problem. And you just have to walk around my ward uh, to smell the smoke. That um, How do we ensure that we give the right information to people, so make people aware how damaging to the lungs is actually to put on an open, open fire and to use improper fuel, for example, wood that's not been dried properly. Um, I, I mean, I thank you for the question. I, I think it's a very good point that we could, we could possibly do a piece of work on communication of dangerous indoor air pollution. I'm, I'm conscious that the the air quality, the emphasis is always on transport, isn't it? And, and wood burning in the home. You may be aware that I raised this issue at Stratton Resources Committee um, not so long ago, um, seeking assurances that the, the, the new local plan coming in wouldn't have the effect of inadvertently encouraging wood burning in the home, for, for largely the reasons that, 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 that you raise. Whether this is something we can, we can do within the kind of the Environmental Protection Service or the air quality team, um, I will go away and, you know, have that discussion, because I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very good point. So thank you for that. Can we have a discussion in terms of public health? Because that is important and under that as well. Through the chair, please, you two. Suggest we have a break at this point. Yes. Um, where is it? Just hang on a sec. Well, yeah, there is a film called Be That Mate about young people and sexual harassment, which will be shown in the conference room during the break. The film's been created by members of South Yorkshire Police Youth Independent Advisory Group and Sheffield Youth Cabinet. It's about four and a half minutes long. It will be playing in the conference room while you're getting your tea. So you will queue for four minutes, watch the film for four minutes, then back here, 10 minute break. Thank you. Once, once my lovely assistant has told me what page I'm on on the uh, How to Be the Lord Mayor Idiots guide I have every month. <laughs> I heard that, Peter Price. <laughs> I 
Item 6, endorsement of the publication of the draft Sheffield Local Plan. This item of business is to provide approval to consult on Sheffield's publication of the draft local plan. A report of the Executive Director of City Futures has been published with the agenda for this meeting and the report contains recommendations for the Council to consider. There's a motion to approve the recommendations in the report and there are two proposed amendments to consider. The motion will be moved and seconded and then the mover and seconder of each amendment will speak and then the matter will be debated. A document containing the motion and the amendments lettered A and B was circulated by email to all members of the council yesterday and has been published on the website with the agenda for this meeting and paper copies have been circulated at this meeting. There's a maximum time limit of 25 minutes for this item and can I now call on Diana Hurst to move the motion. You can speak for up to three minutes, Diane. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm very happy to move this motion. As a long-standing member of the Planning Committee and a current Chair of Search, I know how vulnerable we are as a planning authority we are without the backing of an adopted Sheffield plan. We have considerable ambitions with regard to climate change, biodiversity, affordable and adaptable housing. We want to protect the green belt and create a framework where business, industry, housing providers and, and developers want to come to Sheffield and invest here. We want to grow 21st century technologies, jobs and homes, but without a Sheffield plan and the raft of policies that support that, we're vulnerable to speculative applications that do not have the qualities and design standards that we desire. As a committee member, I have seen how hard officers have worked to bring together a plan that works for Sheffield and supports our ambitions, and I thank them. I ask you now to approve, and I'm going to read this because it's a very long and complicated but purposeful, purposeful uh, title. It has a meaning. The Sheffield Publication Draft Local Strategy. And I should approve that for the purposes of <coughs> consultation and take that next major step towards having an adopted plan. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. And I believe that Councillor Perek is going to second. Thank you, Lord Mayor. In seconding this motion, I wanted to focus us on the role of a local plan in shaping the city we can become. And in particular, the potential of the advanced manufacturing zone proposed in the local plan, and for it, the zero carbon economy we can start building in Sheffield. Through the AMRC and ITM Power, Sheffield is already establishing itself as a focal point for green manufacturing and new technologies. This local plan contains provision for an advanced manufacturing zone, which we want to use to give priority to new technologies and green industry. Under Ed Miliband, the Labour Party has set out a plan to boost green jobs across the country by, de by developing net zero industrial clusters to protect and transition existing jobs in heavy industries while creating new ones. Council, through this local plan, we have the potential to develop our own net zero industrial clusters in Sheffield as a powerhouse for clean growth and unionized green jobs. Why do we need this? Under this government, we've seen good jobs go overseas. A green steel industry in Sheffield should be at the heart of a nationwide green industrial revolution. But instead of actively championing decarbonization, the Tories are instead letting us lag behind other countries. In the absence of national leadership, through this local plan, we can start to devolve questions of industrial strategy ourselves, giving support to the types of industry we'll want to see and build and bringing back quality jobs to areas long been abandoned by this government. There is a way to tackle the climate crisis by delivering good unionized jobs in clean green industries. We should see the AMZ as a first step to that. So council, I ask you to back the local plan on that basis. Thank you, Councillor Nash. Sorry, Parek. And bang on the button. Right, we're now going to move to the um, 
amendments. So can I call on Tim Huggan to move Amendment A? And you may speak for up to two minutes, Tim. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, on the local plan, I mean, this is a minor amendment, but has unintended consequences. My concern of this unintended consequences in uh, it could be a place could be costful, which is dear to my heart. I mean, I was talking to residents uh, the, other, the other week when we were putting up the Christmas decorations uh, together. Um, the effect, this could have the effect, because it's so close to schools, that it restricts, potentially restricts new businesses from opening. I believe that this council hasn't necessarily been the most supportive of local shopping centres over the years, and this would enable, uh, by removing this, it would, not, uh, it would be part of the, um, that would enable them not just to survive, but to thrive. Already policies are in place that stops over preponderance of fast food outlets. This is a robust policy that keeps local diversity within shopping centres. The new policy as proposed will restrict that flexibility to the relet of shop spaces that become vacant. The split site of King Edwards also means that many pupils are commuting between the two different sites um, to get lunch either in Crosspool or Broom Hill. My son has done it quite often rather than come home. Uh, on way between two sites. The distance policy as proposed, that provision over time become more limited as pupils are timed. So I ask that this policy is removed from the draft local plan policies as we already have got adequate policies in place that restrict fast food outlets within local shopping centres. Thank you, Tim. I was just going to ask about Joe now having a new career as a filmmaker. Have you asked for permission? No. Does he need to ask for permission? He doesn't. I bet he does. Yeah, I bet he does. All right. Oh, it's disturbing me. Does that mean I forbid it? Right. Sorry about that. Can I call on Councillor Andrew Sanger to second the amendment? Thank you, Lord Mayor, and uh, I thank the, the officers who have been working up the, the, the local plan. It's really important that this city has a local plan. I'm very pleased that we've got to, got to this stage. Um, I think, as Councillor Hurst said, uh, really important that we keep the, the current green uh, belt boundary and that we have a plan to deliver the new homes that Sheffield needs, uh, as well as the, 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 the new space for, for businesses that, that Sheffield needs. So it's, it's a good plan. Um, and it, it, it embeds the, the, the 2030 net zero target. So a very good plan that we should all support. However, our concern um, is, is about hot food takeaways here and this linking hot food takeaways and secondary schools. And when you look at the map, this saying that there can be no new hot food takeaways within 800 metres of a secondary school, it does not work for this city. And it's because this city is compact. And it particularly doesn't work on the, the S10 corridor, as my colleague Councillor Huggan has said. And it's because of where King Ted's, Tapton, Birkdale, Guilds High School, Westport are, means that the whole row of shops from, from Ranmore, to, from Nevergreen, Ranmore to, to Broomhill would be affected. But if you look across the city, it would also be... Um, um, Mercia would affect um, Millhouses, Ab um, Abbeydale, um, uh, Banner Cross would be affected by high stores, Dorn Village would be affected by King Egbert, the city centre would be affected by, 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 by various schools. So the point is, um, do we believe in choice? Do we believe in, in opportunities for, for adults to have hot food takeaway uh, uh, at lunchtime? That, that's the issue. It's about choice, it's about, it's, it's about um, local businesses, and I don't think that was ever the intention of this policy. So by, if we just take this clause out, we can keep to the, the previous policy, which we understood in terms of hot food, and we can allow uh, uh, vibrant shopping centres to continue and quality new businesses to come in to replace, the, to, to replace the current, current ones. So it's a very simple amendment. We support the, we support the plan, but please support this minor amendment to make sure we have vibrant shopping centres. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Well, clearly not minor to you if you're having to film your speeches. Do tell me when I can see them on your website, won't you? Um, right. Thank you for that amendment. Uh, can I now call on Councillor Lewis Chinchin to move Amendment B? 
You may speak for up to two minutes. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm pleased that Sheffield's local plan is at last uh, progressing. We have now reached the draft stage. A local plan for our city is cr critical to ensure that the planning process is a truly democratic and community-led one. And the government's recent announcement that it will give more flexibility to local councils in meeting their housing targets is welcome. This is the right approach and one that recognises that every part of the country is different. Whilst it is important we get this plan finalised as soon as possible, we also need to ensure that the detail is right. And although I disagreed with the decision to build on Greenfield sites back in February, I acknowledge that full council adopted this approach. But of the Greenfield sites that are included in the local plan, we need to ensure that the cumulative impact does not lead to the merging of distinct communities or the total destruction of the character of an area. This is exactly what will happen if we allocate the Broomfield Lane end of Holland Bus in the local plan. And many of these same arguments apply to the other side of Holland Bus, which is also an allocated site, but I recognise that this site, despite huge local opposition, has already been granted outline permission. There has to be a point where we say enough is enough and we protect valuable green spaces like these on the fringes of the city that are effectively green belts in all but name. I hope other parties will join me in voting for this amendment and I propose it. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Chin Chen. Um, and the amendment is formally seconded by myself. We now move to the debate on the matter. So uh, I have Ruth, no, not Ruth, sorry, Christine, or Tina, I get it, I know I Christine. get it wrong. Christine, to speak, Brian, okay. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I was on the working party, or the cross-party steering group, to work on the development of this plan only since May last year. Other members of my party were on it for longer when it was initially set up. Um, this was an excellent collegiate approach to work out a consensual way forward for planning and how we want to develop our city in the future. The UDP was dated 1989, I think, so we definitely needed an up-to-date, relevant local plan to shape our city for the future. We want to create a livable, sustainable city that people enjoy living in and where businesses can prosper. And I think this plan does all of those things. My previous speakers have already outlined many of the benefits of this plan. And I just want to say that the whole team working on this plan over the years, the councillors and officers, we've worked together very well and we've exchanged our ideas and we've formulated this plan, which I hope can go through as it stands, because I think it's a good plan. I hope after public consultation, the government inspectors will also give it the green light, and I look forward to it guiding the development in our city for the next 15 years. Thank you. Excellent keeping to time there, Christine. Uh, I'm now going to call uh, Joe Otten to speak. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I just wanted to expand on the, on the reasons for the amendment. Um, I, I have three major concerns with this. And the first is that the, the, the idea of restricting what we eat through the planning system is it's a blunt and arbitrary tool. Um, McDonald's is not a hot food takeaway, it's a restaurant. A sandwich shop that sells bacon and egg sandwiches is not a hot food takeaway, it's a sandwich shop. Um, the hot food takeaway is not a category which defines how healthy a meal is. It is, a, it is therefore the wrong instrument in terms of restricting our choices, our choices of what we eat, and that, I speak for everybody in the city who want to restrict our, you know, the danger of restricting our choices of what we eat. And I do fear, I do fear, and this is my second point, that, that there is a little bit of snobbery involved in this. Because if you can afford it, you can go in and sit down and eat and pay the extra, and you might get just the same food. But if you can't afford it, and you want to get a takeaway and take it home, well, the council's going to tell you you shouldn't. You're not rich enough to, that, that we, we trust the choices you want to make about what you eat. And the final point I want to make is 
Look, I think the, 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 the intention here comes from a good place. Public health advice is generally good advice, and we should generally follow more of it. I should probably follow more of it. But it, it is advice, and it's not, it, it's advice and it's not rules. And the reason it's advice and it's not rules, it's not forcing you to do things, is that the person writing your advice can't possibly be in our shoes and understand our lives and, and make the decisions on a day-to-day -day basis of what we eat and when we eat. And that's how it should be. And therefore, it is, it is vague. It is eat more fruit and veg. It is, you know, do this, do that. It's not specific. And so to say, to turn what is a, a, a vague admonition into a rule, into taking people's choices away from them, is just a mistake. It's misunderstanding what the purpose of that kind of measure is. So, you know, it is well intended, the policy on, 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 on hot food takeaways, but it is, it is mistaken. And I ask you for the sake of everybody in the city, not to, not to allow. Um, I think that was yes, really. Pol policy NC12 is actually un a bit unclear to me. It, it, it names two circumstances in which hot food takeaways might be restricted, and one is if it's within 800 um, meters of a school, of a secondary school, and the other is if there's already a high proportion of those uh, outlets already in the shopping centre, um, and it lacks the word and or or in the policy to me. Um, and in, unless that's clear, whether, whether that is in both cases, whether, the, whether both conditions are needed, um, or whether it's either or, I, I find that policy unclear. And I think I'd be very wary of just deleting it. I think possibly it's something that needs a bit more work um, to make it absolutely clear. Um, and also, uh, besides that, um, following public health advice, I would always say is the default position. And uh, I really wouldn't step too far away from that in determining uh, the, in looking at the wider determinants of health in our population, especially in those in their formative years who are laying down patterns for eating uh, for their whole lives. What you see in front of you is what you tend to adopt and do. If the temptation is there uh, all along the high street as you walk home from school, it, it's a big temptation. It smells good. It tastes good. Um, and it's readily available, so I, I don't see there's any harm at all in putting some sensible restrictions in that follow the advice of our Director of Public Health and many other health experts. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. I'm going to ask Brian, that, that one, followed by Julie. Uh, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Lord Mayor. Well, we finally seem to be getting here, uh, and I say this from Appendix 3, page 55, there will be a local plan consultation with potential to generate high levels of public developer and landowner interest. It contains complex issues that would need to be clearly outlined. And the report goes on to say that that will be through multiple methods, online sessions, drop-ins throughout the city, posters in libraries, leaflets, and through social media. So finally, we're getting there. And it's great to hear, because I've been involved with developing the local plan as a member of the public, and now as a Green Councillor for a number of years now. And I have to say, I didn't think that we're going to get where we are. I didn't think we're going to get where we are without Greens in the room. Greens have been positive and forward-thinking in developing the, group, the, the, uh, the plan, We've been constructively working within meetings to make sure that agreement is reached by all parties. There are no stink bombs in the room for us. But there have been years of stagnation on the local plan under Labour. No local plan, no proper planning controls without it. That's been the result. Finally, we've got a public consultation, a proper one, we hope, in January. And that's going to include all the heritage and community campaigners business owners and residents who need to be brought in, who need to be included in that final result. Finally, a clear vision that includes the climate emergency and puts it in within planning controls to fight against that climate emergency. Finally, after seven years, the public will have their say.
putting together this local plan over a number of years, it hasn't been the easiest of tasks. I think we all acknowledge that. But actually, we have a plan that we can be proud of, and I think both Councillor Hurst and Councillor Parrick, who first and seconded the motion, gave us very eloquently the reasons and the benefits that this city will derive from having our local plan. And I thank um, Councillor Gilligan for her support and kind words, which are in contrast to what Councillor Holmshaw has just said in relation to the cross-party working that I think has gone on through both the Transition Committee last year and the Policy Committee this year. So thank you to everyone for all of that. In relation to the amendment from Councillor Chinchain, um, Hollingbusk and opposing both building developments on Hollingbusk is something that I have been involved in since before I became a City Councillor and something that I will continue to fight for. This is an important area in the north of the city. It does delineate two quite separate but close neighbourhoods, villages that have their own distinct appeal. And it's important when we're looking at, as a council, moving to being community-based, making sure that we move our services down to local communities, that we continue to make sure that those communities have their own identities and can continue to operate as such. Therefore, I welcome the um, proposal and I will be supporting it because I think it's important that we are very clear in relation to that. I think it's also interesting that it's only because this council has been fighting the government continually over the last couple of years that they have finally um, yielded to our wish to reduce the number of houses that we can have built in the city. This hasn't happened by accident. We've been fighting hard with the government to make sure that the housing target that was set in this local plan is realistic and to make sure that the green belt and the green open spaces in our city can continue to be enjoyed not only by us but by future generations. So thank you to everyone who's worked on this plan. Let's get the consultation going and let's make sure that we get it enacted as soon as possible. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Um, and we have reached the end of our time here, so I'm going to ask Councillor Hurst if she would like a right of reply or to sum up. I do thank you, Lord Mayor. I just want to quote, we want to put right a minor amendment which we believe has unintended consequences. I absolutely believe that the intention of this clause proposed by officers has the consequences that were intended for it, which is to promote healthy environment and healthy choices, which have lifelong impacts for the people who make those choices. Environments linked to obesity, and be obesity is linked to diabetes, cancer, poor outcomes for life and living, and inequality. <coughs> I, I think that the way that we make choices is framed within that environment and I don't think we can afford to separate those clauses or take them out at this stage. That document is going forward for public consultation. That those clauses were put in there by our health partners and Greg fell in actual fact on the point of unintended consequences um, quotes the Gateshead study in 2015, the Gateshead Council actually developed a policy that prevented new takeaways opening until the six, year six obesity rate fell below 10%. A national chain appealed against that refusal and lost. So I think we're well within our rights to send this document out for consultation with those clauses included. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hurst. So, I'm now going to move to a vote on Amendment A, which was moved by Councillor Huggan, which will be conducted using the electronic voting system unless we have unanimous support for the amendment. I believe I heard the word dissent then, so we will move to a vote using 
the electronic voting procedure. Right. Um, I've been asked to outline it once more, just so that we're all clear about how it works. You will get... Uh, uh, you will get two minutes to vote and need to use the console at your allocated seat. Please do not press the microphone button as this will activate the webcasting system and direct the camera to and audio feed from your console. And you only need to use the screen on the console to vote. There are two steps to the voting system. Press the blue person icon to register that you're going to vote. And then you have three voting options. Green is for the motion, red is against, and yellow is an abstention. And if you're Peter Price, somebody will help you with your colour blindness. Yes, I have voted. So. Okay, I can announce that that amendment is lost. And the, the numbers are... 41 against and 24 for. So we will, that has clearly lost. We will now move to a vote on the second amendment, Amendment B, as proposed by Councillor Chin Chen. And it's the same system again. Oops, hold on, technical hitch here. Whereby you press the blue person. <coughs> no. I suspected that there just might have been, but you're right, I need to not just suspect. Is amendment B agreed? I will take silence as affirmation of that. Or is there any dissent? <laughs> okay, I heard dissent. So once again, we will vote. You press the blue person, and then you vote either green for, red against, or yellow to abstain. Um, I don't appear to have. So that concludes the voting and it looks as though Amendment B has been carried with 56 for and 10 against and no abstentions. I think it was my bit of speaking that swung it there, Lewis. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, I'm now going to move to the vote on the substantive motion, which will be conducted using the electronic voting system unless we have unanimous support for the motion. Um, a recorded vote may be requested by 10 members. If so, the vote will need to be conducted using the electronic method. Is the substantive motion agreed? I will take silence as the affirmation of the meeting. If any member wishes to dissent, please raise your hand. Is this unanimity breaking out here? Wow. So that is unanimously accepted. Thank you all very much. And we finally have the local plan going out for consultation. Right, before you get too excited and giddy, we now have item seven, which is the notice of motion regarding no more excuses on housing repairs. There's a maximum time limit of 25 minutes for this item. It's your time you're wasting. And can I call on Councillor Richard Shaw to move the motion and you may speak for up to three minutes, Richard. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I, I will try to speak anyway. Um, Lord Mayor, this council has more than 6,000 overdue repairs. This, this number is reportedly reducing, but it's far too slowly. Um, the, the council's admitted that almost 300 of these are for damp and mould. And damp and mould cases are more likely to be uh, unreported or the cases closed without being fully resolved. Um, as the uh, tragic uh, case of Awar Bishak in Rochdale uh, de demonstrated, uh, damp and mould is incredibly harmful to uh, residents' health. And regulated housing providers such as local authorities have been criticised by the government, social housing regulator and the social housing ombudsman over, over handling of mould and placing blame on tenants. There's also other serious disrepair issues, such as fire safety doors, which haven't been repaired for over a year. And leaving repairs undone blocks up time of housing offices with residents uh, chasing uh, repairs, time which could be spent you know, resolving um, other issues. For example, uh, Crystal Peaks, 75% of their time is taken up dealing with repairs. And by not completing repairs on time, we as a local authority end up paying far more um, fighting and losing cases in court where we're estimated to be uh, paying out £350,000 in compensation this coming year. And that's why uh, we are calling for an inquiry into how the repair service has gone so badly wrong. My colleague, Councillor Clement Jones, has called for this at the Audits and Sanderson Committee. We want officers to bring forward a report with a full breakdown of the disrepair issues and a strategy for improvement. And we want to set up an arbitration scheme called Alternative Di Disrepair Resolution, which will give tenants an alternative to unscru unscrupulous, no win, no fee solicitors who end up taking up um, most of the residents' compensation. This is a scheme that's been tried successfully in Lambeth and Southwark. And finally, we want to give our tenants the right to directly employ a contractor if we as a local authority have not completed the repair in a timely fashion. And this is something that we called for in our previous manifesto and we want to make, make happen. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Richard. Uh, can I call on Councillor Sophie Thornton to second the motion? And you may speak for up to two minutes, Sophie. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, so 2022 has been a year of crisis with cost of living, energy crisis, our continuing NHS crisis. But I'll add to that for Sheffield housing disrepair crisis. Earlier this year, I spoke to my grandma. She, she was in tears. 
because she'd asked me if I'd watched the news and she knew that I'd been raising issues with Sheffield's council housing disrepair. Um, because, and I didn't know why she was upset. I hadn't seen the news, but my heart dropped when I found out about baby Awab in Rochdale. He passed away due to prolonged exposure to mould when he was two years old. Social prov housing providers have since been put on notice and we've been told that we need to clear, clean up our act quickly. But it shouldn't have taken a child to die for this government and Michael Gove to wake up to the problem that, so that social housing tenants and council tenants in this city and across this country have been crying out for help for years. This isn't a problem that's unique to Rochdale either. A Sheffield couple told they're being moved out just days before Christmas due to black mould. Sheffield families tell of tell fears over mould and damp health threats so severe it made her children struggle to breathe. A family of seven with four children in one bedroom, that they're in a two bedroom home covered in damp and mould. All of these are headlines about Sheffield in the last 24 hours. A mother recently contacted me because her child has been referred back to hospital with asthma and she fears that that's due to the mould in her council property in this city. And it's not just COVID's fault, or the government, or the tenants, because they're too often told that it's their lifestyles causing issues with damp and mould. In Sheffield, we have long since been behind Barnsley, Rotherham, Harrogate, Leeds in dealing with our backlog of housing repairs. Enough is enough. Sheffield City Council's failure to tackle our repairs backlog of over 6,000 overdue repairs, to get a grip on damp and mould, to fix da drafty windows and broken doors in one of the coldest winters we've had in recent years, is leaving people worried, cold and desperate. Is it any wonder that they're turning to those no-win, no-fee solicitors that are costing us so much? Is it any wonder that those lawyers are profiting? Yes. Thank you. Please support this motion. There are two proposed amendments, and these are numbers one and two on the list of amendments circulated at the meeting. May I call on Councillor Fran Belbin to move amendment number one, and you may speak for up to two minutes. Thank you, Lord Mayor. My heart too goes out to the family of our Abishak, whose death was not only tragic, but so clearly avoidable, and I can't have been the only councillor in the room who, when they saw that case, Thought, I know cases in Sheffield like that that are giving me as much worry and immediately thought of constituents in my ward. Now there's constituents in all housing sectors who are struggling with these issues, in the private sector, in our housing associations, but also in our own council properties. The worst case that I've been dealing with concerns a young child with a respiratory illness who is in one of our council flats. There's so much mould in that flat that his mum has had to throw out furniture throw out clothing and other items of uh, other belongings that have been damaged by it. And I've seen the letter from her GP that says her husband, uh, her child's chest uh, is getting worse uh, because of the damp and mould that he lives in. Now there have been a catalogue of missed appointments, failed solutions that have made this worse and a refusal to rehouse her because in theory these problems are all going to get resolved. But two years on, they still haven't been resolved. So like Awabishak's family, she took out a disrepair claim, and who can blame her for doing that? And from there, actually, matters got even worse because the communications are now tied up between legal teams rather than directly with the tenant, which is wasting lots of time, it's wasting lots of money, and it's leading to zero action. And I'm also sick of hearing, again, in all housing sectors, about some of the useless advice that is given to tenants about damp and mould. It's no use telling people that they shouldn't be drying their clothes inside when they have no more outdoor space. It's certainly no use telling people that their breathing is causing the condensation in the home that they can't afford to heat. What are they meant to do with that advice? So I do strongly support the reviews and policy development that's recommended in the motion and in this amendment. And there are other actions that we need to be taking. Hack the council has already written to all their tenants explaining how they're going to prioritise damp and mould. We have to be better than we are at the moment. We have to be empowered to make other housing sectors look better than they are. Um, and the government have to step up to protect our households. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Councillor 
Nabila Milana to second the amendment, and this is Nabila's maiden speech. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm proud to be a counter of Park and Arbathorn. This is the ward I grew up in and still live in today. But as I'm sure colleagues across our chamber will be aware, last year's census showed that Park and Arbathorn is the most deprived ward in our city. For every four households, three are considered deprived. And surprisingly, the largest bulk of my casework is housing. Like many others in my ward, I'm also a renter, and I have rent lived in rented accommodation almost all my life. Central heating that doesn't work, holes in the kitchen floor, a shower that could be described as temperamental at best. The repairs would always take months, but the rent could never be a day late. At the time, I didn't know community unions like ACON existed. So when my last landlord sent my family an eviction notice under Section 21 of the Housing Act, this came at one of the worst possible times. We really thought we were going to end up homeless. Luckily, we got advice from Shelter. And at Shelter Workers are on strike today, I send them my gratitude for the work they do and my solidarity. <laughs> but it's important to remember that this isn't just my story or my experience. This is the experience of thousands of renters across our city. My generation are the largest generation of private renters in this country. We're most likely to be in precarious work, and most of us are one paycheck away from homelessness. And as sad as this is, we also know that none of this was inevitable. It was all political choices made by a Tory government who will never have to bear the consequences of their choices because they don't rely on social housing, they don't hand over their half their wages to their landlord, and they don't count pennies and pounds at the end of the month. So what do their political choices mean for my community? It means reporting a crumbling wood in July and being told you've got a repair appointment in January next year. It means front doors that don't lock properly so you never feel safe in your own home. And it means five children and two adults with a baby on the way cramped into a two-bedroom house with mould covering the bedroom wall because they don't meet this government's definition of statutory overcrowding. And the minimum waiting time for them to be even considered for rehousing is five more years. So what is the alternative? The answer is quite simple. Affordable, good quality, eco-housing for all. Making sure that homes are for people, not commodities to be bought and sold. We're calling for a review of housing repairs and adopting licensing schemes throughout the city so tenants are left to the mercy of landlords. And as we've heard, there's no doubt there's a housing crisis in this country, and I really hope colleagues across the chamber will join me in doing what we must do to protect the residents of Sheffield. Thank you a lot, Mayor, for allowing me to go my time. <laughs> Splendid, wasn't it? Well done. Um, we now have the second of the further amendment. May I call on Councillor Douglas Johnson to move amendment number two? You can speak for up to two minutes, Douglas. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. And, uh, thank you, Councillor Malanga. That was a really good uh, maiden speech. I really enjoyed listening to that because it um, actually describes you know, what we need to know. Um, from a, a position of authority of being there. Um, and yes, it's good to, just good point to describe, you know, the situation that, that we're in. Because, uh, and of course, I've got to recognise, actually, in, in Sheffield, you know, we still have our own council housing. We have a lot of it compared to most councils. We're a big landlord ourselves. But it's been overtaken by the private sector, so the private sector has really grown. And we've got our other role here of um, doing our best to supervise the um, the, the private rented sector, where there's a huge amount of work to be done, um, and with you know nowhere near enough resources that have been re reducing year on year, and that's the uh, that's the situation that we're in. At the same time, we've got the dilemmas, and this is something that you know again we've we've worked through this cross party and the housing committee about when to um, when to. You know, put more resources into increasing the amount of stock in the city so we can get more people rehoused, get them out of substandard accommodation, or whether it's to you know, put the money instead into um, you know, jobs on the ground. Um, so uh, we might not want excuses, but there's no easy answers there. Uh, I suppose just my point of reflection is that um, 
there is an obvious answer why there's such an escalation of uh, repairs, and we all know there's been COVID where uh, lots of our staff couldn't get into people's homes. Um, and that's a backlog that's being worked through. We know that officers are trying to turn this round. It's a slow job. I, I think we need to be careful about um, criticising the people who go out and do work, certainly in the light of when they've really pulled out the stops to go and de deal with Stanage and Hillsborough in the last week. And of course, I think we can expect that that will mean that there's been all those people taken out of doing these other essential jobs on damp and mould um, in, across our housing stock, and that will have an impact on the, you know, the apparent figures. You know, so we, we've got to bear with that. But I think it's right uh, for us all to keep on top of the, the housing issues. And um, I just finally want to credit the officers for setting up the uh, damper mould task force. So yeah, thanks to everyone. Thank you, Douglas. Um, and now can I call on Councillor Martin Phipps to second the, the amendment. Two minutes, Martin. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Congratulations to Councillor Maulana on her fantastic first speech. I look forward to hearing many more in the future. The death of Alab Ishak at just two years old for something that could have been prevented is horrific. Far too many people in Sheffield and across the UK live in substandard housing, where landlords attempt to pass responsibility and blame to tenants around housing disrepair. I can frustratingly think of several instances where landlords of private, social and council housing have attempted to pass off mould as caused by tenants or tried to downplay its severity. Housing disrepair such as damp, mould and pest control issues have a real impact on health and well-being for tenants and incredibly sadly can be life or death. It's vital that we work cross-party to address housing disrepair in the city I know this is a priority for Douglas as Housing Committee Chair. To do this, it is incredibly important that we are enabled to take serious action by receiving appropriate funding to do so. We can't ignore the elephant in the room that the council housing repair backlog has been driven by austerity and the cutting of resources caused by this. I hope we can all support the request to government for the resources to properly address this critical issue. I hope we can also all support the need for more resource to inspect and take action against disrepair in the private sector. This is something I know as a city ward councillor we have seen, and we've also really gratefully seen the benefit of the great work the private housing standards team does in seeking and enforcing action against this. I hope you all support our amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, we now move to debate on this issue. Um, I've got a few people who've asked to speak. Oh, sorry, no. Uh, can I call, is it Tom Hunt, please? Thank you, Lord Mayor, and uh, congratulations to Councillor Milana for an excellent maiden speech. Um, after the tragic death of Owa Bishak, the coroner said that this should be a defining moment for the housing sector. They're right, and a new task group in the council to tackle cases of damp and mould across social and private housing is welcome. But it's right that we do more and take a wider look at our services, which is why we're calling for a review of housing repairs. We must ensure that tenants are listened to and that complaints and repairs are dealt with quickly. So we have to tackle damp and mould, but let's also be clear about some of the root causes of this situation. There's been sustained underinvestment in housing by this government and underinvestment across parts of the private sector. A survey by Shelter found that 42% of private renters, 4.7 million renters, have had problems with mould in the last year. That's part of why we're calling for the council to introduce selective licensing scheme to help drive up private rented housing standards. We also can't separate out this issue from the serious hardship that people are facing right now. Many people can't afford their heating. Cold homes lead to condensation and damp, which puts more pressure on repairs. There's nothing inevitable, as we've heard, about the cost of living crisis. Choices have been made. A choice was made in 2012 by this government to <coughs> cut funding for home insulation. As a result, home insulation rates dropped off a cliff. A choice has been made to reduce help with energy bills in the new year. A choice has been made by this government to cut year-on-year -year funding for local authorities. This council has lost 2.1 billion in real terms since 2010. That's the context we're in. I'm sure, and we've heard it, that there's a collective will here 
to improve the repair service and group housing across the city. We have heed the coroner's words. We must do better, but we need an honest and willing partner in government to work with us. Spot on timing there, Tom. Um, I'm going to ask Simon Clement Jones to speak next. Because I believe we have to have the entire ward membership speak on this item. <laughs> Um, absolutely right, and uh, congratulations, uh, Councillor Maloma, a cracking speech. Um, and I usually get up on my hind legs and, uh, and say the first thing that comes into my head. Um, this time I have written it down because um, it's from a, 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 an email I got from a single mother of four kids um, whose house is riddled with mould, um, and I want to get this right. Um, despite her attempts to right it away, um, it, it just keeps coming back. In November, they contact, contacted repairs who were told that the earliest they could visit was March. Um, she wrote, since our family moved into our new dream home in June 2021, we have suffered nightmares of incessant faults which have been attended by completely indifferent Sheffield Council repairs representatives who seem to revel in talking down to me and being unhelpful because I'm a woman. Two men arrived at my house following my reporting my badly le leaking roof. They inspected my children's bedroom and confirmed that it was a bad leak, but they could not do anything about it without scaffolding. Although they said they were unable to do anything, they terrified me by saying that the ceiling may collapse due to the weight of the water and that I should keep an eye on it and uh, should knock a hole in it to relieve pressure if it looks like it could fall. The men left my home and said I'll, I'll mark it down, but I don't know when the job will be done. I only want to be treated as a human being and to live here with my four children in a house which is safe and healthy. Is this too much to ask? This is happening in this city Right now, tenants and people of this city deserve to find out how standards have fallen so low in this city. Why has it not been brought under control? We can't blame austerity, coronavirus or the cuts. Why has our performance been so much lower than other cities like Leeds that have also had austerity covered in the cuts? We need answers on behalf of the people of Sheffield and I'll be fighting to get them for them. Thank you, Lord Mayor. speaker I have is uh, Ben Miskell. Um, Lord Mayor, um, Councillor Moana referred to a family um, in Arbathorn in her maiden speech which was very heartfelt. Um, that family is living in absolutely deplorable conditions. As part of this debate I think sometimes it's very easy isn't it, to talk about a service, a council service in a quite abstract way. And a number of members today have raised specific issues about specific families that we're very concerned with. I want to raise the experience of Mrs. Um, Obeyed, who lives in a two-bedroom council house with her five children and a partner. That's a total of seven human beings who, because of the very limited definition of statutory overcrowding, are forced to live in a cramped council property, a council property which suffers from significant damp and mould, and in my view, is not fit for human habitation. In October, her GP wrote a letter to her to say that the damp in her house poses a health risk to her young children. He went on to say that the youngest of which, and the quote is, crawls on the damp and mouldy carpet. Lord Mayor, it upsets me that any property that this council operates on behalf of residents in this city would be in such a poor state of repair. And it worries me that Mrs. Obeyed has to spend many months demanding better for her family. She's worried, understandably, about the health of her young family. And as local councillors and her MP, Louise Haig, were also very concerned. I'm pleased to see that housing officers have now said that Mrs. Obeyed and her family are eligible for what's known as temporary, a temporary decant, meaning that she can move temporarily into another property. However, she's not happy about that, understandably, because that does mean moving in and out of a property. And I understand that a property, a temporary decamp property, hasn't actually been found for her. So she's still left in this house that's very difficult. Lord Mayor, housing is, we know, a human right, and no family should be living in damp conditions or fear the state of their own housing. And, and actually, we desperately need, need action on housing disrepair for, for people across this city. Thank you. Councillor Diamond. 
Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor, and congratulations to Milana for an excellent maiden speech. Um, I'll be brief, but um, I just wanted to also raise the uh, issues of reporting. Um, I know that um, the, the repairs line is very um, is often very hard to get through to, and people are waiting for a very long time to speak. And there are also problems with uh, interpreters not always being provided uh, so that people can't always um, get the support they need and they're often fobbed off if they don't speak English as a first language. Um, I'd also like to bring, draw attention to the situation in asylum accommodation. And I welcome um, some cross-party working with Councillor Belbin, uh, um, hopefully working with colleagues to go and inspect um, some of the Mears properties uh, where the conditions are um, truly awful. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm being told here that I ought to be moving to a right of reply, but I have two more people, so you're going to have a minute each. You know, like just a minute, Mike. Go. Oh, sorry. Let me start again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Lord Mayor, the Housing Repair Service was in source five and a half years ago. And it has been on a downhill slide up until recently. This has been developing and developing over all that time. Finally, though, and one of the major issues was the failure to address the terms and conditions of the workforce, which has demoralised them. Now they've been sorted out, you can start to turn things round. But it will take time. And compounded with this, we have a capital programme which is slipping in terms of roof repairs, which means there's even more pressure on the maintenance department to deal with those sorts of failures. So we've got to quickly move things forward and get on top of this, because this is the only way we're going to get the houses under control. Thank you, Lord. Still excellent. And finally, Councillor Tony Downing. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and uh, thank you uh, to the, uh, for the brilliant maiden speech uh, we had earlier. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak on the Labour Amendment uh, this afternoon. It's a known fact that since 2010 that the government has heaped massive pressure on housing revenue account through lack of investment for local authorities and public <coughs> services, which communities rely on and we should never forget the hand that the Liberal Democrats had in this. Also for, the year, also for years since 2010, the government put a cap on council borrowing. This in turn affected the house building programme, which was desperately needed after the rights to buy initiative. We now have a situation where first time buyers are struggling to save for a deposit, let alone get a mortgage. All this adds to the pressure on the HRA, which in turn means less revenue for housing repairs. My inbox for a long time has been full of complaints in respect of repairs. Tenants have been failed time and again. Properties, especially flats, have water ingress with damp and mold on the walls and ceilings. Spores are appearing, causing people with breathing issues, including asthma and emphysema. The sad death of little Awab Ishak in Rochdale must be a wake-up call, with thousands of outstanding repairs, mainly due to damp and mold. The fact that the last decent home standard was set in 2006 is testament to this government's failure and that they must now deliver their decent home standard for all social and private rented housing. Lord Mayor, the district heating system at Westfield and Waterthorpe in my ward is another case in point. The infrastructure has been in place ever since the estates were built around 40 plus years ago. Every year, the system fails, and usually as winter starts, leaving tenants without heating and hot water. Last year, I spent a full weekend until late into the night trying to get the heating and hot water restored for tenants with small children and elderly. And the elderly. Tony, Cap Tony. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm sorry, but thank you for your contribution. <coughs> and Sophie, you have a minute. That's fine, thank you. Um, let me speak anyway. 
I just wanted to mention um, I'm very happy with the amendment um, point seven and also congrats to Nabila, excellent speech I thought. Um, I'm talking about the mention of right to buy. I think this is an extremely important addition. Ending right to buy would generate income for us. It would also bring down prices in the rental sector. It would make owning houses more affordable to so many of us. And it would actually drive up standards as well if there was an abundance of council housing. No policy is a silver bullet, but ending this damaging policy is as close as, and I don't think without ending it that we're actually going to get anywhere as close to um, what we're calling for in the motion and the amendments. Um, I was disappointed to see that some of the Labour front bench have moved away from their committal to ending this policy, if in government, and I hope that people can persuade them, that's in the Labour Party, um, to move back to that because I think it is excellent, and I'm really glad to see that um, in the amendment today. Thank you. Well done. I'm now going to move, um, sorry, no, um, Richard, you get a right of reply, don't you? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'd like to uh, thank members for a very uh, um, constructive uh, debate, um, including uh, you know, councillors uh, Felbin and, 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 and Miskell, among others, who have shared uh, examples of how uh, mould and other issues are affecting their constituents. So these issues are very widespread. Um, across the city. Um, Councillor Malona, um, congratulations on an excellent uh, maiden speech and you know, rightly hi uh, highlighting the impacts on residents in the private rented sector. Uh, Councillor uh, Johnson uh, mentioned the impact of, 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 of COVID on, on repairs. At a, at a housing committee in February 2020, pre-COVID, um, you know, it, was, it was stated that the, the backlog of repairs was at least six months. It would take six months to get through. That was before COVID. So as Councillor Livery hi highlighted, the service has been failing a long time, particularly since um, you know, the insourcing. Uh, Councillor Clem uh, Clement Jones, um, you know, you know, I highlighted that everyone, all, all residents, should be treated with dignity and respect, and their concerns not dismissed. You know, all, all our tenants should be given the respects that they deserve. And we must, as a local authority, get our act together so that people do not fall prey to predatory uh, no-win-no-fee solicitors so that their health is not damaged by our, our, fa by our you know, failing repair service and that they can have homes to be proud of. I urge you all to support our motion. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Richard. Right, I'm now going to move to the vote on Amendment 1, which was moved by Councillor Fran Belvin, uh, which will be conducted using the electronic voting system unless we have unanimous support for the amendment. Is Amendment number 1 agreed? Lord Mayor, if I may, I'm happy to vote for, but there are some, there are some parts. <laughs> Hurrah. Really? We still need to refer to the CCA. Okay. We still need to register it for those that are preparing the delegate to vote. Okay, we are going to have to take this in part. Uh, that was what you said. We are going to have to vote electronically anyway, and then we can add your parts. Do you, have, you, have you told us yet what they are? Yes, yeah, so in, in voting four, we will be abstaining on under part one, six and seven, and under part two, number five. So that's one, brackets six and seven, and two, brackets five. We'll be abstaining on. We're voting for the rest. Lord Mayor, if I could also vote in, in parts, please. Um, I'll be voting against, but for C9, E4, E5, and new paragraph. Please. Thank you. Okay. In which case, press your blue person and then vote, either for or against or abstain.
Okay, I can announce that that amendment was very narrowly passed by 65 to 1. And we will now look at amendment 2. Hang on. So we're now going to move to the vote on amendment 2, moved by Douglas, which will be conducted using the electronic voting system unless we have unanimous support for the amendment. No. Is amendment two agreed? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in which case we will all vote again, press the blue person, then vote for or against or abstain. Uh, Lord Mayor, in parts again, please, for, for me, and vote in... Um, or I'll be against F. Thank you. Okay. So this time I've got sixty four. Yeah. Somebody here? Gone? Okay, the amendment is lost, 11 for and 53 against. So we now move to the substantive vote um, motion. Uh, I'm going to move the vote which will be conducted using electronic voting unless we have unanimous support for the motion. Uh, Somebody said the same. Lord Mayor, we, we want to do the same as before in terms of the Labour text, so there's a we abstain <coughs> on some clauses. Sorry, but Joe, can you say that again? We that wish context? to abstain on some clauses again. We're happy to vote for it, so it's, I don't think it's really dissent, but we will. We wish to vote in parts. Okay, so you're voting for with yeah. some against. With some abstentions. The same abstentions that we did the first time round. Okay, and Diane. <coughs> yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, again, like Councillor Altman, we are voting for this motion, but we are voting in parts. In voting for, we will be voting against C4. And okay. Lord Mayor, um, as yeah. with um, the other councillors, I'll be voting for, but just as I did with the Labour amendment as well. Thank okay. you. Sophia, are you thinking of voting? Right, I have one person who hasn't voted. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay, well, I'm just going to call it. It's unanimous except for one person who hasn't voted. So it's 65 in favour and one person who decided not even to abstain. There we go. So that is agreed, subject to the parts. And Paul, you will work those out for us to know. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So with that, we now move on to item eight. Notice of motion regarding 
adopting the all-party parliamentary group um, on British Muslims, their definition of Islamophobia. There's a maximum time limit of 25 minutes for this item. Uh, it's probably more like 20 minutes. Uh, can yeah, I've got some of the clock. Oh, have I? Uh, after three and a half hours from 3.30 to start. Oh, that's not very great. In which case, can I call on Councillor Abdul Kayoum to move the motion, and you may speak for up to three minutes. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Can I first of all also congratulate my colleague, Councillor Molana, on an excellent uh, maiden speech. Lord Mayor, Islamophobia and anti-Muslim hate crimes make up the vast majority of the religiously motivated hate crimes in the UK. In 2021, 45% of all religious hate crime was targeted against Muslims, 45%. That is a staggering figure, but when this is broken down to hate crimes around specific events, the increase in Islamophobia attacks reveals an even more harrowing picture. For instance, after the Manchester Arena attack, 500% increase. Boris Johnson's infamous comments comparing Muslim women to letterboxes led to a 375% increase. And after the Christchurch shooting in New Zealand, Islamophobic incidents in the UK rocketed by nearly 700%. Here in Sheffield, South Yorkshire police reported a 43% increase in reports of Islamophobic hate crime in 2021 compared to the previous year. These figures, Lord Mayor, present a very bleak picture of the realities that Muslim communities are faced with on a regular basis. And with almost 50,000 Muslims living in Sheffield, much more needs to be done to tackle Islamophobia. Lord Mayor, we've had some appalling hate crimes perpetrated against Muslims in Sheffield over the past few years. Schoolgirls attacked, taxi drivers assaulted, women being spat at. With one particularly dreadful incident where a schoolgirl was literally pinned to the ground, repeatedly punched and choked by her own hijab by a 40-year-old woman who told her that her hijab was making her sick. And it's not just physical attacks, Lord Mayor. Islamophobia is manifested in so many other ways that can cause fear, anger and shock as well as well-being issues such as problems sleeping, depression, anxiety, and paranoia. The Coalition Against Islamophobia states that it is demonstrated in and articulated through speech, writing, behaviors, structures, legislation, or activities which embody hatred, vilification, stereotyping, abuse, discrimination, or violence directed at Muslims. Islamophobia is a hate crime. Hate hurts, and no one should have to tolerate it. Lord Mayor, Sheffield City Council is a major employer and a service provider. It is imperative that we have a clear, uniformly accepted definition of Islamophobia across the council. Only then can the many different forms of it, it is many, it, uh, the many different forms in which it's manifested be recognized and effective, robust strategies be developed to deal with it whether that be in our employment practice, our service delivery, or part of the work that we do with many of our partners in the city. Sheffield Council needs to be taking a leading role to help ensure that Muslims, Sheffield's Muslim community is treated equally on the same footing as the rest of Sheffield's communities. And I move this motion. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kahu a very passionate speech. And can I ask Councillor Abtisam Mohammed to second this motion and you may speak for up to two minutes. Thank you Lord Mayor um, and firstly I'd like to congratulate my colleague um, Councillor Molana on her excellent maiden speech um, and I fully agree with everything my colleague uh, Councillor Kayum has said in his powerful um, speech. We've seen 12 years um, of Tory divisive debates uh, negative and sensational reporting, which often inflames local, local tensions, and this in turn results in a rise in hate crime. However, in my view, Muslims are not only targeted for their religion, but are also perceived as racialized communities, especially since race and religion are intersecting identities for so many people. 
I could tell many stories about myself or my family members being verbally abused, spat on, but for me, this isn't the important thing today. Last night, I went to watch a production telling the powerful story of two migrants. I left inspired, not by their difficulty or their challenging experiences, but that despite their difficulties, their harrowing personal experience, they still chose to use whatever power they had to help others, to make a difference and to challenge division and the hostile environment. No matter how bad or divisive things feel, we should never accept things as they are. Most of us in this room will stand against any form of discrimination, and that's right. Most of us will want to see an equal and just society, and that too is the right thing to do. But our verbal stance without action is hollow. Action must, be, must start with a recognition that there is work to be done, improvements to be made, and done with the right pace. Yes, we must stand against all types of prejudice, not a hierarchy where some cause more offence than others, but a recognition that all bigotry and hate is not acceptable. I agree with everything Councillor Kayum has said, and adopting this definition is essential to tackling the issues that he's raised. For that reason, I'm seconding the motion. Thank you, Councillor Mohammed. Um, there is one proposed amendment, and this is number three on the list of amendments. Uh, sorry, Lord Mayor, if I may, um, Councillor Woodcraft has had to be urgently called away, so oh. I've arranged for Councillor Woolhouse to move and Councillor Masters to second. May I call on Councillor Woolcraft to speak, please? Woodhouse. Woolhouse. Yeah, I'm, read I'm reading Cliff's name at the same time. You know what it's like. Uh, thank you Never very much. Apologies. Yeah, thank you on. very much, Lord Mayor. And uh, can I congratulate Milana on her maiden speech? It was very good. Um, yes, we, we're proposing this amendment. It's a friendly amendment, actually, um, because we do support this uh, motion wholeheartedly. Uh, the Liberal Democrats were the first national party to adopt uh, the APPG definition of Islamophobia. And it was announced by a daily in Parliament in March 2019. And the Liberal Democrats sit on the APEG as well. Uh, we want to celebrate the contribution of Muslims to this country and value Sheffield's Muslim community. Adopting this definition allows us to understand how Islamophobia can manifest more insidiously in education, employment, politics, and policing, in addition to the explicit hate crimes and abuse. I feel as though I can speak partly on this issue because over the years, I've lived in Sheffield a long time. Uh, before I came here, I lived in various other places and I was very lucky to be accepted into those communities. Um, I feel as though we can move forward on this and um, have more acceptance of, um, through other, other methods. I've had various jobs where I've, um, I've been involved um, with various ethnic and um, I feel as though discrimination, you know, cannot be allowed in any way and the various jobs I've had have allowed me to do this by making sure that everybody around me and other people who I've worked with do know what discrimination and racism is all about. And that's the crux of the matter, is to make sure that we get the message over about how it cannot be tolerated. And um, particularly in Sheffield, where we're known as um, the city of sanctity, and sanctuary, I should say. <laughs> so we are supporting this, but I hope you'll support the amendment um, so that all people feel safe and will not tolerate racism or all these other things, either covert or overt. Um, and it's something that needs to be done. Thank you. Um, Anne, according to our lists, that was your maiden speech. Was that so? Yes, it was, although I don't see myself as a maiden. <laughs> well, you
Well, you certainly weren't in distress, were you? <laughs> Thank you very much for making your maiden speech for us all. Very thoughtful. And can we move on now to... It's going to be seconded by Barbara Masters. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, apologies, I've not really prepared a speech as such because I wasn't expecting this. But first of all, congratulations to Councillor uh, Molana and to Anne for their maiden speeches. I'm really happy to second this motion as it acknowledges the huge benefits brought to this city as well as to the UK by Muslims. We can only evolve as a society if we are open to fresh ideas and practices. And I regret how much this can be resisted by those who fear change for whatever reason. The unscrupulous prey on fear and ignorance. We've seen different communities being targeted down through the years, religious and cultu uh, cultural. It's no comfort to know society has failed to learn lessons of the past, and I speak from personal experience over this. The motion makes clear Islamophobia is not acceptable. Hate stops here. Our amendment expands on why, so I trust members will support it. Thank you. Thank you for your stopgap. Um, right, we now move to a debate on the matter. So far, I've only had one indication of a speaker, uh, and that's Councillor Garbutt. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm, I'm really uh, very happy to be able to speak today. I think um, myself and the rest of my party welcomes this motion. Um, it's, it's well needed. Uh, we need a definition of Islamophobia, and I'm not going to repeat the reasons why um, Councillor Kayum and Councillor Mohammed have uh, spoken very eloquently about those. Islamophobia blights our city and our country. It flourishes because the hateful press seeks to sow division, even though we have, in the words of Joe Cox, much more in common than that which divides us. It flourishes, too, because of the biased nature of the prevent strategy, giving permission to racists to be racist. As a result, we lose many of the benefits of the contributions Muslims can and should be able to make to society. So I look forward to the day when unity is valued above division and where no one is silenced because of their colour or beliefs. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Garbutt. Um, were you waving at me uh would you like to speak? Right, and if you do, I believe this is your maiden speech as well. It is, I thought, you know, be the cherry on top. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm very close, uh, obviously, with my hijab and being Muslim, but also, I have five children that are Muslims and pay back now to society now that they're above 20. I have a daughter who wears a full hijab like me, who's a a full nurse, and she worked through COVID non-stop and lost many patients. With her, first, with her full hijab, she tried to comfort the ones that were in ICU. She, try, she cried over them when she lost. She never looked at anyone's um, religion or color to save their lives or make them feel comfortable. But, but she has been picked on in the buses. She's been kicked out certain buses on her way to the hospital. She's been spat on, assaulted many times. I don't know if she can come home when she goes to work. Somebody has stopped me and asked me, what do you think the problem is from when they look at me? And I don't know if they have a problem with my weight, my height, my color, or my hijab. When I go on the bus, that's the reason I bought a car. It's because the bus driver decides to speak very, very loudly because he thinks I'm deaf because of my cloth. We really don't know what the problem is. When English people or other guests come to our country, we
We help them. We welcome them. We're fascinated by them. And we take their knowledge. But when we come here, we don't know what they're fighting about. The idea is about education. Islamophobia is not about saying, you're an ISIS or you look like this. Islamophobia is about attitude as well. We don't want to be a tick box. Just because you have a friend who's a Muslim doesn't make you educated or understand Islam. We want to have real conversations. We want you to come up and ask us real, real questions. And we will teach you why we move this way, why we pray this way, why do we look like this way. Most of your children, who are 17 years old, can be anywhere they want in the city. I have a 17-year-old, a student child, boy, and I can't, on the Friday prayers after where he comes, I can't really say to him, you can go anywhere in Sheffield dressed as Muslim. So it is severe, and it is something we live under every single day, let alone any qualities or the way that certain people speak to us or an attitude. I'm, as a, as, as a single mother for 12 years, and I have five children, and I've always been an under financial stress, I'm tired of always protecting my children in case, or the youth clubs that I look after, in case somebody says something. Again, it's about the attitude, and for that, we need Sheffield City Council to lead this and make sure all the staff and everybody and all the partnership around the city is educated and watch their mouth and their attitude at the same time. Thank you. speeches from women and all great so thank you all three of you for speaking this afternoon anybody else wanting to say anything in which case Abdul would you like to sum up Thank you, Lord Mayor, and can I again uh, congratulate Councillors Woolhouse and Councillor Sehi on their very emotional, very excellent maiden speech. Thank you. Lord Mayor, I, I'm, I'm very pleased and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, uh, that you know, we, we've got support uh, throughout the Chamber across uh, all parties for this, uh, for this motion. Um, we need to understand and, and I think we need to make it clear that obviously adopting the motion for the council, sorry, adopting the definition for this council is a starting point. There is a lot of work to be done both for the council and this city to ensure that the Muslim communities in this city feel safe and are able to prosper. So thank you very much for everyone's contributions and I hope now that we can go down the road of making, making the city better for Sheffield communities. Thank you. Right, um, we have one amendment. Yeah, we have one amendment. Yes, that's okay. Right, we have amendment number three, which has confused my colleague here by me saying we have one amendment and it was moved by Councillor Anne Woolhouse. So can I ask, do we have assent on this? Whoa, okay. In which case that is now incorporated into the substantive motion. And do we have assent on, I'll just ask you to put your hands up anyway just so that we can see the voting. All those in favour of the substantive motion on adopting. That's just great. Thank you all very much. And that was just the start. We may have passed that resolution, but that doesn't mean that, that for it's just done. The work starts with this, doesn't it? Councillor Cohn. Thank you. Right. I've got to, yeah? Okay. 
So we now have item number nine, which is notice of motion regarding moving towards an ethical debt collection policy and ending the use of bailiffs. Maximum time limit of 25 minutes for this item. Uh, and can I call on Councillor Sophie Wilson to move the motion? And you can speak for up to three minutes, Sophie. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I often find this a bit disrespectful if I was to normally do this, but I didn't think for a second we'd actually get to debate this motion. So I didn't really prepare anything. I don't know if anybody else did. Um, most of the input is in the motion. I will try my best. Um, and I've taken a look at the amendments as well. I'll be voting for most of the Labour amendment, um, except the part about differentiating between people who can pay and people who won't pay. It's not that I disagree with that point. I just don't really think it's in spirit of the original motion. Um, and I think I've provided quite a bit of evidence that um, regardless of whether someone campaign is refusing to pay, um, actually there are already quite a few mechanisms to overcome that, in such as um, attachment of earnings, um, and the court can decide. There's actually, um, it's one of the only debts that you can actually get a prison sentence for, um, so it's quite hard to just avoid paying counter tax if you don't want to, um, and you've got loads of money in the bank. So apart from that, I welcome um, that amendment. Um, and this was actually, this kind of, this campaign was brought to me by constituents, actually. It was part of the um, debt justice campaign. It used to be called the Jubilee Debt, Jubilee debt Campaign, I believe. They changed the name because it was a bit confusing. Um, quite a few people in the chamber might have had emails from constituents about that campaign. So I worked um, with them to come up with that notion. Um, so yeah, I really hope that um, people in this room can support it today. Thank you. And the motion is formally seconded by me. So there are two proposed amendments, and these are numbers four and five on your list of amendments. So can I call on... Uh, Minesh, are you going to... Right. May I call on Councillor Minesh Perek to move amendment number four, and you may speak for up to two minutes, Minesh. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and I also didn't think we'd have time for this. Uh, congratulations to Sophia, Anne and Vila for their fantastic maiden speeches. Um, in moving this amendment, I particularly wanted to stress the, the impact of debt on people's mental health and well-being. We know that people who've missed council tax payments are disproportionately likely to suffer to have suffered from mental ill health. We should, as a council, be doing everything we can to mitigate the, the crisis of indebtedness. Council Wilson's motion is really welcome and shows a route forward to a more ethical debt collection policy that puts residents' health and well-being front and centre, while at the same time, as the example of Hammersmith and Fulham Council shows, leading to a rise in council tax collection rates. As we are still in the middle of a cost of living crisis, it is essential that the council consider in the broadest sense how we can deliver meaningful material changes to those most in need. And this is why we think the council's cross-party cost of living working group must also give specific consideration to debt collection and the use of bailiffs. Where there are policies that make both financial sense, but more importantly, moral sense, then we should wholeheartedly be pursuing these. Thank you. Timely again. Uh, can I call on Councillor Brian Lodge to second this amendment? Thank you, Lord Mayor. And Congratulations to colleagues that made the maiden speeches today. Uh, like Councillor Wilson, I didn't think we'd get to this either. <laughs> so, but I think it is important, and you did raise an important point in there, that you, you, you mentioned about in our amendment where it talks about uh, the differentiator between those that can't pay and those who, don't, who won't pay. I think we, we do need to, to, to keep that in there. As we've seen in... Uh, so many times in, in questions that come before the council and, and members' questions that ask about arrears on council house renting and things like that and council tax, we do attempt to recover and we gather about 99%, I think, of council tax overall uh, and we do recover rent arrears from people throughout as well. And where there are difficulties, then it's right that we should be supporting and we should be making sure that you know, particularly if there are mental health issues of people and it's a, a, impacting on things and, and debt and, and, you know, the cost of living crisis that we're facing now, then we do have to take into account and we have to be ethical in what we do. We've got to take responsibility of helping those people. But there are people out there 
who can pay and won't pay. And as we've heard before in so many things, it was mentioned around, Councillor Johnson mentioned it around uh, the district heating. That burden falls on other people, so it's not fair when other people, when people can pay, that they are not paying their, their share through. So we, it, it's right that we do have a policy to recover whenever we can, but we have to temper it with a bit of humanity, and where people need that support, we give them that support. Thank you, Robert. Right, thank you. Um, and we have another amendment. Can I call on Councillor Shafak Mohammed to move Amendment 5, and you can speak for up to two minutes. Well, Mayor, um, who's that? So, Lord Mayor, if I may, um, the, our amendment will be seconded by Councillor Alan Hooper, so Auckland is not available. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, first, I would like to start by congratulating colleagues in the Chamber who made the emergency speech, Councillor Waterhouse, Councillor Saeed and Councillor Moana. Fantastic speeches, they were all applauded, but that's where it stopped. From now on, it will be the usual um, uh, treat. Kindness, kindness, as Lord Mayor says. Um, in terms of the amendment, I think there's a couple of important points we need to raise. I think Councillor Lodge did, did touch on one of them about those who can pay but don't choose to. I think what our amendment talks about the practice from, I think it's Lewis District Council that actually looks at and actually Eastbourne as well, and looks at those who are genuinely struggling and those who are, you know, basically thinking they can get away with it. Well, you know, it's, as, as I said earlier, you know, in terms of district heating, everyone has to pay, and those who don't pay means that those that, you know, do the right thing may end up paying more. One thing I do want to raise with colleagues here, and it was raised at Strategy Resources, I think Councillor Fox also commented on this, was the issue around that this council actually spends... £827,000 at the moment on citizen advice and due to COVID it all moved online and what's not happened is since we've started opening up services that's not gone back some of it to face to face and I know for example representations I've received uh, both on the phone and in person that they are, there is a demand out there in some communities within some people for face to face and what I'm suggesting is that uh, I know me and the leader are looking into this, that we should start to look at how we can provide that because that's probably where people need that advice, debt advice or uh, any other advice, particularly given the cost of living crisis. So happy to support uh, the, uh, the kind of the sentiments of the motion itself. There'll be, there's some, there will be one or two little issues we might want to uh, differ on, but the, the thrust of it is that, you know, uh, sending in bailiffs should be the last resort, not the first resort. And we as a council should look at how we can better spend our £827,000 in terms of the CAB. And I'm sure we can look in the new year to bring in some changes. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And I believe Councillor Hooper, who is waiting very patiently, is going to second this motion. Thank you, Lord Mayor. <coughs> Again, caught on the hop, I wasn't expected to speak at all. Let's <laughs> <laughs> even worse. Congratulations to the three who made the maiden speeches and really passionate speeches and I think they were well received. I'm sure they were well received. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd just like to expand a little on the citizen advice. Uh, yeah, welcome that. But I would like to mention for the north area, uh, in Chapel Town, we have a citizen advice, Chapel Green Advice Centre. Uh, it's mainly funded by Ecclesfield Parish Council uh, and it does provide and has provided right through COVID a face-to-face -face, uh, opportunity for people to come. Uh, around 50%, I believe, aren't from that area. They come because they can actually speak to someone. Uh, there's people that come from Sheffield 6, Sheffield 5, and, and, and beyond. We've also got a lot of people that come uh, from Barnsley, on the border, and Rotherham. So it's really welcome. And people, some people do want it. They do want face-to-face. -face. They can't do it over the telephone or they can't do it on the internet. So I would urge the council to seek some face-to-face -face opportunities throughout the city. Um, we've already got um, that in Chapel Town and over the hill in Stocksbridge, there's a project going on there where there will be hopefully uh, a provision for a 
assistant advice worker to be in Stockbridge. I believe one day a week, uh, which will again be welcomed. So thank you very much. Thank you. I was just going to add that at the S2 food bank, we have um, an SLA with the CAB, and I'll use more acronyms if I can, um, whereby they do come and give face-to-face -face advice because, like you said, we found that telephoning just wasn't the same, that actually speaking face-to-face -face is what certainly gets people talking and solving things. Um, I'm now going to open this up for debate, and I have Councillor Jones who'd like to speak. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to talk in support of going after those that choose not to pay their debts. I, I for one, would never want anyone to get away with not paying their due courses. If you were to avoid paying your taxes, I don't think there's anybody in here who wouldn't go after them and say, come on, you've got broad shoulders, Get your hands in your pockets, pay up. Because if you don't pay your taxes, other people won't be able to get the services that they so desperately need. Same with debt. If you're not prepared to pay your debts as a choice, because you choose not to pay for it, because you don't want to, then you're being pretty selfish, and I don't think we should be encouraging that selfish and ignorant behaviour. But there's another thing about why we should challenge those who aren't paying. There may be genuinely, and there is often the case genuinely, where those that can't pay bury their heads. They try to ignore the debt. They try to hope it goes away. That will never actually happen. And only by interrogating why they're not paying their debt can we actually start to address whether they're getting the help and the support that they truly need. So we shouldn't actually drop this element of making sure that people do get challenged for not paying their debts. Because through that challenge, through that interrogation, and with compassion, as others in here have said, can we truly make sure that everyone gets the support they need and maybe gets onto the right path, the helping hand that we all need to get away from debt and get away from that anxiety that's caused. So we should not ever simply say, they're not paying, let's just ignore that. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Oh, stunning silence. Does anybody else want to speak? So if you get a right of reply. Okay, in that case, Sophie, if you'd like to sum up the debate. Of course, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just could, um, touch on a few things that was mentioned. Again, I'm, I will support most of Labour's amendment, apart from the, um, uh, the reference to people who won't pay, because, again, I still believe that actually it's a, it's a very small minority of people who are choosing not to pay, and I think there are very adequate ways of dealing, that, with, dealing with that already in place. Um, and I'm always very wary of, of additions like that um, in motions like this. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of um, calls to kind of crack down on benefit claimants because there are people who take the mick um, and things like that. And actually, deep down, I actually believe that bailiff use is barbaric and outdated. And I really hope that in, um, in the near future we look back and think, oh, God, I can't believe um, as a country we ever used that method to collect debts. Um, as I've put in the motion, um, I did also men men mention um, that recent evidence has been showing that um, moving away from bailiff use and an ethical debt collections policy actually increases collections. Um, so we just don't need bailiffs um, at the end of the day. So I can't vote for that bit. Um, I won't be voting for the Lib Dem amendment, but I do actually very much agree with your points on citizens' advice and face-to-face -face, um delivery on that. My partner Josh, he is a debt advisor for Citizens Advice locally, um, in Barnsley actually, um, and he tells me a lot about um, how much easier it would be for people if they could see them face to face. Um, a few more issues around that is kind of their targets that have been increased, um, more and more people just getting into debt, people in deficit budgets that they're unable to help. Um, I could go on, but I could see it's gone orange. Um, I can't vote for your amendment because I think you've deleted some of mine, but I do hope that when it's referred to committee that we can discuss that at a later stage. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so I'm now going to move to the vote on the amendment number four, moved by Councillor Minesh Parekh. 
which will be conducted using the electronic voting system unless we have unanimous support. So is Amendment 4 agreed? Send one there. Send, please. Uh, well, I am actually voting for, but, oh, <laughs> but abstaining on, 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 on just, just the one paragraph, um, which is O. Which is um, okay, so if we don't go from it, so that you can, you can vote in parts, as it were, is that right, Lewis? <laughs> yes, please. Okay. Right, what are you voting against? I was, sorry, I was voting for, but abstaining on O. Okay. Lord Mayor, can I vote for and against Q? For, but against Q? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Press your green person and then vote, please. Uh, we're two votes out. Anybody not voted? <coughs> oh, this is confusing. Still two votes out. Okay, I'm going to close voting. And the amendment is carried by 59 with no, no one against, no abstentions, and two no votes. Okay. So we will now move to... Oh, what was that bit? So we'll now move to the amendment as moved by Councillor Shafak Mohammed, which will be conducted using the electronic voting system unless we have unanimous support for the amendment. Is amendment number five agreed? No. no. Okay. So, again, can I ask you all to vote? Lord Mayor, Ooh. in voting four, we are voting against paragraphs one, three, and four. Okay. Lord Mayor, in abstaining, I'll be for uh, paragraphs one and two. Please, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> we have a result. We, the amendment is carried by 46 to 10 with one abstention, but the parts which Labour voted against are lost. Is that okay, so now we move to the substantive. And again, we can vote electronically unless we have unanimous support. So, is the substantive motion agreed? Dissent, Lord Mayor. I don't know who that was, Lewis. Um, is is that against or is it, it and against in parts? It, it's against and in parts. So, um, in voting against, I'll be for... Um, so, in paragraph N, bullet point one through to seven and bullet point nine um, and the same as 
uh, voting the same as the amendments. Okay. So everybody else, press your blue person. Oh, another one. Sorry. Sorry. We're voting for, but in voting for, we are voting, we are abstaining on clause A, which I believe was left in. We are voting against M, and we would like to vote against the subclause within N that says ending bailiff use. Here's a third party and there ain't no sanity clause. That is clearly carried 56 to 1 with two unvotes. Okay, if we move on to item 10, which is the appointment to the office of senior coroner, South Yorkshire West. This. Uh, This item of business is to approve the recommendations in the report of the Executive Director Operational Services published within this agenda seeking approval for an appointment to the Office of Senior Coroner, South Yorkshire West. These recommendations are to note that the written consent of the Lord Chancellor and Chief Coroner to the proposed appointment has been received and to appoint Tanika Rawdon to the Office of Senior Coroner, South Yorkshire West, in accordance with the Coroners and Justice Act 2009. The motion to approve the recommendations in the report is to be moved by Councillor Richard Williams and seconded by Councillor Ruth Mesereau. So, Councillor Williams. Yeah. Formally proposed, Lord Mayor. Thank you. And Councillor Mercero. It's Mercero. Oh, uh, I'm failing today. I'm so sorry. I apologise. Indeed. Thank you. Okay. Right. Does anybody else want to speak? No. In which case, I'm going to move to a vote. Oh. Ben. Would you like to speak? Lord Mayor, it's just a, a question for clarification really. I, I understand that we used to have a, a commoner for the city of Sheffield and this is for South Yorkshire West which seems quite interesting. Um, is this part of a wider Ministry of Justice um, uh, cuts program? Have we moved towards amalgamating commoners for, for, for South Yorkshire as a whole rather than just our city? To just casually say the report makes reference to the background to this, then. And I'm going to make it sound like I've read it as well. Okay, before we have an outbreak of mass hysteria here, um, are you satisfied with the answer you received? Good. So I'm now going to vote, move to a vote on the motion. Is the motion agreed? I'll take silence as affirmation. Anybody who wishes to dissent, please raise your hand, don't you dare. Ooh, that's past, yeah, you see, you see Douglas just wandering there. 
Okay, that is unanimous. We've approved it. Thank you very much. Um, item 11, minutes of the previous council meeting. It is proposed that the minutes of the meeting of the council held on the 2nd of November 2022 be approved as a true and accurate record. Is that motion formally moved, Councillor Hurst? Formally moved, Lord Mayor. Thank you. And is that motion formally seconded, Councillor Alston? Formally seconded, Lord Mayor. And is the motion agreed? Agreed. agreed. I declare it carried. Uh, item 12, memberships of council bodies and representatives to serve on other bodies. Uh, this is moved by Councillor Diane Hurst and seconded by Councillor Sue Alston that approval be given to the changes in the memberships of committees and other council bodies and the appointment of representatives to serve on external bodies and related issues as detailed in the schedule circulated at the meeting. Councillor Hurst. Formally moved, Lord Mayor. Councillor Alston. Formally seconded, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Is that agreed? Thank you. Um, I have one it urgent item of business. Item 13, statutory officer designation, chief finance officer. Council procedure rule 26 states that an item of business may be considered at a meeting of the council as a matter of urgency where it's not been possible to give five clear working days notice on the recommendation of the chair but the reason for such urgency must be recorded in the minutes. The approval of the council is required for the interim director of finance and commercial services to be designated as the statutory chief finance officer in accordance with section 151 of the local government act 1972. The current chief finance officer leaves the employment of the council with effect from 31st of December, 2022 and therefore this designation needs to be approved at today's meeting as the next council meeting on the 1st of February is too late. A report on this matter has been produced and was circulated to members of the council yesterday and has now been published on the council's website. Copies of the report are available in the council chamber and the public gallery. The motion to approve the recommendation in the joint report of the Council's Monitoring Officer and the Director of Human Resources and Customer Services is to be moved by Councillor Diane Hurst and seconded by Councillor Sue Alston. Formally moved, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Formally seconded, Lord Mayor. Thank you. I'm now going to move to a vote on the motion. Is the motion agreed? I'm going to take silence as an affirmation. Great. So that motion is carried. Um, I've had a request from the acting monitoring officer and head of legal, I've probably got that in the wrong way, to say something. Oh, you wanted with me. Okay, let's just try this again. <laughs> I think that was a see me in my office remark, wasn't it? Okay. That concludes the business of today's meeting. I will say Nadolig Llawen and Bluidhi Newiza to you all. And I hope you all have a really, really good time over Christmas with your families. There is a reception in the reception room, I believe the Mandela room, for anybody. Just wait. <laughs> um, for, to join with uh, members of the Ukrainian community and our Ukrainian delegation who've been here and also in the mayor's parlor and with that I thank you all for your attendance and I'm going to ask a former Lord Mayor if she'd like to say anything. Yes oh. thank, thank you Lord Mayor oh, I just wanted you. to let you all know that we raised £487 pounds from the collection so thank you for your generosity and you know that that will be divided between Park and Tony and the World War II veterans. So thank you. I don't know. But thank you all very much and see you in the month.